right, let's call to order at 502. Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Jessica Corwin, I'm the vice chair and our chair Greg Gottschalk is on his way. He'll be here in about 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll be chairing until he gets here. Um, we need to review and approve our minutes from November. Uh, I'll move to do so. Second. All in favor? Okay, so the warrants are presented for signature. There are nine warrants totaling $89,202.06. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, the general fund and school choice expenditure reports were provided in advance. Also happy to take questions whether they're from the last meeting that got canceled from snow or from this meeting. And things remain on track at this point. Um, there are a couple of um, building things that came up that we are going to talk about now, even though the boiler is a little bit later on the agenda, but we figured we'd talk about it while we were here. I'm wondering if we should wait for Greg on that. I want to do all the, we have a lot of building issues I want to kind of lump all together because it's different expansions with a lot of different parts. I'm going to start one here and talk about it later. We just lump them together. Why don't we come back to it? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the only other thing that I want to comment on is that Peter had requested some information about the school lunch funds and the current status of the school lunch balance. Um, so currently year to date, the school lunch program is at a loss, um, but considering our projections for the rest of the year based on what last year's revenue was in the school lunch program, uh, Mary does feel confident that by the end of the year we will be in a positive balance. Uh, that negative balance is slightly impacted right now because of the loss of food from the freezer that went down. Um, so we did have to buy some product, but even without that, there would have been a small de deficit at this time of the year. Um, but we do predict that things will get back on track. Um, there's more expenditures this year than there were last year, as we all know that that food director's salary was absorbed into the school lunch program. Um, so that's impacting things a little bit, but so far it looks to be in decent shape at this point. Yeah. Obviously, one of my reasons for asking about that was that just as we moved the food service director back into that account at the cost of the salary there, um, you know, this goes back stuff over several years ago where that money had, has, has, that account has a surplus in it that would perhaps be unusual, but that's the way it is. And when I look at something like the uh, cost of, uh, I think we've talked in the past about maybe there would be some expenses in, in the uh, food surface operation in the way of capital, you know, relatively small capital expenses that, you know, could that maybe, you know, be shifted into being paid by the that revolving fund. Um, so I'm assuming you're looking at that, and I'm assuming it's, you know, depending upon how the overall budget stands and so on, that may be something that may be worth doing. I know when I went over and signed the last set of warrants back last month, there were several items that were dealing with just uh, service and main maintenance of some of the larger equipment pieces there. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, that's something that could both legitimately and logically be, you know, charged off to the revolving fund instead of the general budget if we needed to. Yeah. We're definitely looking at that closely. Um, and there, there may have to be some additional expenses that are being paid out of that account. We also want to be careful with that surplus because if the, if food service continues to carry the food director's salary. Right. Um, we want to make sure that we do have Understood. enough funds for that and that we can carry over a small balance from year to year. So we're definitely looking at all of those pieces. Okay. And you are jumping ahead because we're going to probably look at those funds when we talk about how we're going to fix the walk-in because yep. we'll talk about the insurance. Yep, it exactly. Is, it is okay. amazing coverage yeah. regarding that walk-in. Yep. So we're going to have to dip in there as well. Yep, okay. <clears throat> Any other expenditure questions? General funds for otherwise. That's all I have until we come back to some of the capitals. Um, since Greg is, I see this wonderful sea of red, and Greg is our vote on negotiations, I'd like to wait on him for public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we can skip down to the principal's report, please. Sure. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, S, and this is a combination of the December and January reports since the December meeting was canceled. Um, but SES in the news, girls who code and guys read. Our library media specialist, Rachel Kidder, leads bi-weekly enrichment programs for our sixth grade students. The Girls Who Code program is a local chapter of a national organization 
that provides opportunities for females to explore the field of computer science. Um, a handful of our sixth grade students, um, female students in um, er early fall went down to Gillette Stadium for a mass Q conference to present what they were working on. And then also we have a guys read book club that meets during their lunch period bi-weekly where the participants share book recommendations in a fun environment. And these two clubs were featured in a, an article in the Greenfield Recorder recently. So congrats to Rachel Kidder for all the hard work that she has done. Um, the LPAC Safety Forum was held at the beginning of December with the help of Mr. Howell. Uh, Mr. Howell and I presented to our English learner families uh, covering a large range of topics including school safety, reasons for school delays and closures, building security safety drills, and visitor and sign-in procedures. Uh, Barnes & Noble Book Fair was held on December 6th. This is, uh, serves as an annual fundraiser um, mm -hmm. for our school library. Um, we always have a great turnout of staff members um, attending this event. Food drive success. Um, our sixth grade, once again, led a very successful food drive um, to benefit the food bank of Western Mass. In total, 253 pounds of non-perishable food items were donated to the food bank. Um, this was also, this was run by um, Ellen von Fladern and Ryan Copeland, our sixth grade teachers. Um, congrats to Katie Miranda, our strings teacher, Megan Carr, our band teacher, and Susan Matsui, our general music teacher for putting together a successful winter concert for families. Our strings program features students in grades three through six, band for grades four through six, and then there was a chorus performance by our fifth and sixth grade students. Um, on Jan Wednesday, January 1st, we held our annual snowflake skate at the UMass Mullen Center practice rink. Um, this is a fundraiser for our sixth grade class. In total, $764 was raised to help the sixth grade class attend the Morse Hill Outdoor Education Center at the end of the school year. Um, upcoming events and mark it on your calendars. Um, next Thursday, January 30th, is International Night. This is always a beautiful celebration of the diversity that's found inside the walls of Sunderland um, and our community abroad. Um, so that starts at five o'clock with a potluck dinner and then there's a musical performance starting at six. We have a few assemblies coming up in the next month or, no, month or so. We have a science night at the end of February which is being put together by our um, community engagement coordinator, Amy Battisti. Um, more assemblies and arts night is coming up on March 25th. And lots of meetings. <laughs> and that's the report. Questions? What else can we do without Greg? You can do the school improvement plan. School improvement. Great. So during our um, November meeting, we presented a draft of the school improvement plan for the 1920 school year. And the reason it was just a draft is because the school, next school council meeting was being held in the middle of December. So that was held on December 9th. And um, our SES school council um, voted to improve, uh, approve the plan. There's seven goal areas, including curriculum instruction, assessment and data analysis, special ed services, positive student behavior, early childhood playground, school and community, and going green. So that was... Um, voted on and approved by the school council, and now it's um, handed over to the school committee for a vote, for a vote, to approve, or not. Right. <laughs> That's sort of the primary thing the school <coughs> council focuses on, is that correct? So they monitor that throughout the year? Yeah, and there's, so I have a, um, like kind of a tracking sheet that I use to highlight all the different um, initiatives or events that uh, fall under each goal. Um, the school council is made up of parent representatives, a community representative, um, school council representative, and also a couple members of our um, faculty and staff here at Sunderland. Who are the members this year? For? School council. Parent, parent members are Amber, oh, okay. Amber Olenek 
and Craig Tiedman. Community representative is Cindy Benjamin. Um, school committee is Maisie Shaw. And SES staff are Rachel Kidder and Amanda Berg. We can go into discussion. Discussion items number C, which is a pretty straightforward. Basically, the collaborative is looking to add two more schools, Worthington and Gateway. I think Gateway was once part of it, and then withdrew at one point, and is looking to get back in. It needs a vote from all the school committees in which the collaborative represents. Um, it also the other the other part of the changing of the charter is. Been a while since I this. Um, that the state can appoint a commissioner liaison to the committee if it so desires. It hasn't in the past, and that they are going to charge non members from 20% to 25% for their offerings, their services, and such. So, um, this basically is that you're a member of their organization, you are a voting member of their organization, they need you to vote to approve those changes in welcoming gateway and rigging to. Looking for a vote on that. <clears throat> Is there any possible reason why we wouldn't approve them? No, that's what I'm saying. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy stuff. That's why I brought it up right now. <laughs> uh, Not much of a discussion you really need to do. Yeah. Thank you kindly. Thanks for for taking over. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. And we also so what we did is we called the order, we did minutes, we did the financial statement, we skipped public comment, principal report, skipped the C, back to you, so we're back to public comment. I think we have someone this evening. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, again, a lot of people here. Uh, we're going to ask people to keep it around three minutes if possible, and uh, we'll uh, see hands. All right, let's go in order. Vicki. Tonight, I speak in honor of the wonderful colleagues I'm privileged to work with each day in our ongoing effort to reach a fair and equitable contract. My name is Vicki Palmer, and my roles here include psychologist, counselor, and head teacher. I practiced in four states, from central Maine to rural West Virginia and at all grade levels. And I've found a home at Sunderland Elementary School for the past 16 years. I'm blessed to work with some of the most highly skilled, dedicated, and caring men and women who each and every day devote more than 100% of themselves in order to help students learn, grow, and become prepared 21st century citizens. I watch every day as educators pay out of their own pockets for snacks and necessary school supplies, transport students to and home from athletic games, attend birthday parties, sporting events, and dance recitals, buy mittens and gloves, and yes, even winter boots for our students. Faculty at Sunderland Care and it shows through their professional practices of helping students gain critical academic skills while simultaneously teaching and reaching students who require support in turning swords into plowshares. Each day, faculty arrive early and stay late, volunteer to coach girls on the run, lead before and after school music lessons and rehearsals, plan, organize, and shop for evening school community events and write scripts 
gather props, and very recently organize after school rehearsals for the 300th anniversary of this wonderful town. Together, we work tirelessly to reach and teach students whose backgrounds include trauma, substance abuse, and poverty, and we keep going because it's the students we care most about. The product of a Sunderland Elementary School education is renowned. Is it any wonder why our school boasts an enormous school choice population? Students are served best here at Sunderland because of these shared professional skills and faculty dedication. Yet we continue to be grossly underpaid in comparison to our district counterparts. My colleagues at Frontier with similar roles make substantially more money than I do, even though we share the same qualifications, the same students, and the same job responsibilities. Tonight, I ask each of you to step up to and embrace a powerful, respectful, and very necessary change. Help us close the gap. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jeannie Johnson. I'm the school nurse here at Sunderland Elementary School. I received my BSN, my nursing degree, from the University of Massachusetts nurse, and maintain a national board certification as a school nurse. I'm in my 19th year in the Frontier Regional District. I started at Waitley Elementary in the year 2000, and then worked at Deerville Elementary as their special needs nurse for nine years. I've been in Sunderland now for nine years. In a typical year at Sunderland, I log over 2,500 nurse office visits and administer over 3,500 treatments and medications to students. But I want to impress upon you tonight, the heart of what I do is to provide nursing care and monitoring of our students who have complex, chronic health conditions. It's my responsibility to work behind the scenes to ensure that these students are included in all aspects of the school experience. But more importantly, I'm here to teach and reinforce age-appropriate self-care. This requires patience, practice, preparedness, and a plan for if things go wrong. These are self-care tools that are required for healthy autonomy at Frontier. I help them grasp these tools. We are aware of the wage and benefit disparity between the Union 38 district teachers and the Frontier Regional teachers, but our community may not be aware of this impact. <clears throat> the teachers are nurses at Frontier with the same number of years as me, with the same amount of education, are teaching and caring for the same community of students, yet they have a different contract. In their contract, these teachers earn approximately $3,000 a year more than me. If they have a spouse or partner carrying the family health insurance, they are given a $1,000 per year stipend. This benefit is not available to the Union 38 teachers. So in total, that's a net gain of approximately $4,000 more than me per year. I am here tonight to represent also the professional teachers I work with who could not speak here tonight because they're at their second job. Some of these teachers work an additional 20 hours a week or more. Name another profession that requires attaining a master's level degree, but the salary compensation requires a second job to make ends meet. You know me, and I know your families. So let your children be proud that you addressed this antiquated pay disparity, and we are not expecting it to be closed in one year or even three years. I love my work, but I'm asking on behalf of my hardworking colleagues and myself that you make progress towards closing this wage and benefit gap. Yeah. Thank you.
<laughs> My name is Lily Smith and I'm in fourth grade at Deerfield Elementary School. One of the most important lessons I've learned from my teachers is to learn from your mistakes and then try to fix them. I understand that there has been a mistake made over the years. Mr. Modesto explained that in 1954, an increase in pay was offered to attract new teachers to Frontier Regional High School and Middle School when they regionalized. Then he said that in about 2010, Frontier teachers lowered their health insurance and were given more money, while elementary school teachers got a lower percentage. Those were two moments when school committees, at the time, made the mistake of not noticing that gap and not trying to close it. That was their mistake. You have the chance to learn from the mistakes of the past and try and fix that. I understand that it is hard and it takes a lot of work to fix a mistake. It may not happen fast, but like it says in my mom's classroom, just because something is difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It just means you should try harder. I want you to think about that and really try to close the gap for my family, the other teachers' families, and the future families to come to make their lives easier. Thank you. My name is Mason Smith, I'm in seventh grade, and I go to Frontier Regional High School. In my six years at Deerfield Elementary School, I had six teachers, Mrs. McFarland, Miss Graves, Miss Yagajinski, Miss Andrews, Mrs. Danak, and Mr. Hale. They all were amazing teachers and each had their own personalities and ways of teaching. They were unique, but they all have one thing in common. They are paid less than Miss Leonard, Mr. Hosley, Ms. McLaughlin, Mrs. Quimby, Mr. Vendetti, Mr. Cisse, Mr. Merrick, and Mr. Cheryl. Perhaps you recognize these names. You should, because based on the way they are paid, they seem to be your more valued teachers. Although they are all my teachers this year, and I am glad that I am being taught by them, my elementary school teachers prepared me and taught me so that I would be successful in middle school. Because of my elementary school teachers, I am able to read the texts that is now presented to me. As an example, it took Mr. Hosley two hours to teach us how to find the value of x in an expression. Imagine the time it would take if it weren't for the math and reading foundations built by my elementary school teachers. Why are these teachers being compensated differently? I know this is that this discrepancy has happened over time, but the corrections need to start sometime, and why not now? As you may have noticed, I have braces. As you all probably know, braces cost a lot of money. I go see the dentist once or twice a month, and next month I will have a minor oral surgery. I personally don't know the specifics, but my parents could be paying about half of what they are paying for my braces and my surgery if you gave them the same dental coverage that you give to the middle school and high school teachers. Why continue to ignore these differences? I recognize that this is not an easy choice for you. You may have many factors to consider. But I ask you, why wouldn't you choose to start to close the gap to give them equal pay, give them dental help, and make our family's life better? I can't make you do that. I can only try to tell you why it is the right thing to do, and then hope that you choose right and kind. Thank you. My name is Amalia Smith, and I go to Deerfield Elementary School. I am in sixth grade, and my teacher is Mrs. Palacio. In my classroom, I like to learn, experiment, and especially ask questions. Now, if you don't mind, I would like to ask one question right now. Why are my elementary school teachers not getting paid as much as my soon-to-be 7th grade middle school and high school teachers? I really appreciate that all through my elementary school career, my teachers have given me the respect to try and answer my questions as best they can. So if you have the answer, I'd love to hear it. In addition, I will be getting braces soon, and I don't know if we will have just enough money. I don't understand why it has to be a struggle for my family to pay for dental care when friends of mine or parents who work in the middle or high school don't have the same worries about what they can afford. Yesterday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. 
When I learned about it, I found out that while Dr. King was trying to get his message out, no one would listen to the grown-ups. So in 1963, the children stood up to fight for what was right and marched with Dr. King. The children had to be very brave and courageous in front of all the grown-ups, but it all paid off and they finally listened when they wouldn't before. Now, in 2020, it's our time to be brave for the teachers. It's our time to stand up for what's right. It's time for you to listen and do what's right for us. In the words of Dr. King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice. follow that. <laughs> um, amazingly proud that you're students in this district. Good evening, my name is Lisa Zavorny, and I've been a teacher for the past 34 years. 20 of those years have been here at Sunderland Elementary School. I love what I do. Watching children grow and learn each day is the miracle of education that happens daily in our school community. One of the many aspects of what I love about the Sunderland community of professionals here is their ability to meet each individual child where they are and how they are and help them grow. It's become increasingly clear to me during my time at SES that most families expect as well as appreciate this individualized attention. Meeting each student's need is an art that I've developed over those 34 years of teaching. I hope this is valued by the students and the families who benefit from it. As a parent of four children myself, I know I want my children's teachers to take the time and make the effort I believe they are due. Being a teacher, I can attest to the fact that this does not happen between 8.15 and 3.15. I am certain everyone in this room understands how far beyond our contracted hours we regularly work for things such as parent-teacher conferences, community events, and special celebrations which Sunderland is so well known for. After 34 years of teaching, I work a second job in order to pay for the growing cost of health care insurance for my family that I purchased through the town of Sunderland. The town pays only 60% of that cost, leaving me paying well over $800 a month. This cost, as well as all the other costs of living, which have grown so much over the past 20 years, our wages have not grown proportionately. It is my hope that this community will show their support by providing us with a fair contract that will begin to close the gap between the elementary school and Frontier, as well as reflecting at least the cost of the increases we incur. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alicia Reed. I have been at Sunderland Elementary School for eight years teaching. Um, during that time, I have made substantially less than my colleagues at Frontier, despite teaching the same students. I am asking that you please support a fair contract that begins to close the gap. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Salda Poole and I'm a special ed teacher here at Sunderland. From an early age, I was taught that knowledge is power because I was raised with the belief education opens doors and only through education can we be truly liberated. It isn't surprising that I've spent the past 22 years as an educator. I received my undergraduate degree from New York University, my master's in special ed from Northeastern Illinois University, and did postgraduate work at University of California, Berkeley. My gypsy soul fell in love with the community of Sunderland, and I have made my professional home across the hall in room 14 for the past 10 years. In the decade that I have been at SES, I have seen many changes. Changes in our community, changes in the needs of our students, and changes in the roles of teachers. No longer are we simply teaching our kiddos reading, writing, and arithmetic. The students we see now may have significant health challenges or multiple mental health diagnoses. They may be involved with DCF 
And some days they might be so dysregulated that very little learning can happen for them. This is the reality of, for many of our children in our bucolic town of Sunderland. Some days it can be heartbreaking, but despite these growing challenges, or maybe because of them, teachers at SES keep reaching, teaching, and loving our students because that is what we do. And our students progress, and they learn, and they grow. You can see that in the data, but more importantly, you can see it in the students' faces when an aha moment comes, and they know their teacher didn't give up on them. Students love Sunderland Elementary, and while the building is beautiful and the classrooms have resources, it is the teachers here that make the difference. I think that's why parents love Sunderland, too. Amazing as it sounds, 54% of the students I see during my day are school choice. That means the family lives in another district, but the parents or guardians feel strongly enough about the education they know their child will receive at SES that they have chosen to send their child here. And that has everything to do with the caliber of professionals in this building. We are literally drawing in students from surrounding communities. We are that good. There is an Iroquois philosophy commonly known as the seventh generational principle, which states that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. While this principle is commonly and rightfully referenced in terms of how we interact with our earth, it can also be applied to other aspects of our lives, both personal and professional. The decisions we make today should be made with an eye toward making a better tomorrow. Making a better tomorrow includes supporting a contract that ensures this beautiful Sunderland community retains and sustains the type of highly trained, deeply committed teachers you have come to know and love. Please support a contract that helps close the gap. My name is Matt Howell, and I have had the privilege of being a teacher in this school for over 20 years. As an elementary school teacher, I tend to be an optimist, seeing the glasses half full instead of half empty. As school committee members, you share in this hopeful vision. You believe in our school's mission to nurture every one of our students to their fullest potential. Here in this building and in the other elementary schools in our district, we lay the groundwork for our students' future, their future education, their future careers, and their future lives as citizens and community members. This is critical, creative, and demanding work. Any researcher in education will tell you that innovation starts here. The most recent example is recognizing the importance of social and emotional learning. As elementary school teachers, we are leading the way on this front. Again, as school committee members, you recognize the value of the work we do here in the school, and you demonstrate that by your dedication and willingness to serve on this committee. You don't believe that it is fair or equitable for teachers at this level of education to be paid less than our colleagues at Frontier or any other secondary school. You acknowledge that historically, elementary school teachers were paid less because they were mostly women. It's still mostly women who are teaching at this level. What has changed, I would hope, is the idea that this wage disparity is acceptable. None of you believe that a teacher who works just as hard and performs a job just as valuable should be paid any less because she is a woman. In the year 2020, as we start a new decade in the 21st century, you know that the right thing to do is to advocate for wage parity between the teachers in Union 38 and Frontier. We may not get there in this contract, but you are committed to moving in that direction. You recognize that the half, half full glass that I see needs to be filled up a little more. Thank you. My name is Samantha 
Samantha Marsh, um, and I'm a second grade teacher currently here at Sunderland. Um, I was hired in 2016 after receiving my master's in elementary education at UMass. When I was hired, I was ecstatic to join this district. The school and the district have always maintained a great reputation, and I was proud and honored to join such a dedicated and professional faculty. In the last four years here, I've put so much time and effort into my role as an educator. I've spent countless evening and weekend hours, as I know everyone here has, planning engaging lessons, entering data and assessments, reaching out to parents and families, and continuing my own professional development through workshops, online courses, articles, books. As teachers, we're expected to be prepared, energetic, compassionate, eager, and nurturing at all times. We must be flexible, changing our carefully thought out lessons on a whim because a student needs extra support, or a staff member is out sick, or there's a lockdown drill, or there's a fire safety lesson, or the students simply need a break. We teach five to six core lessons a day, and we must be able to differentiate our instruction so that students can access the curriculum. We must build in time to teach social emotional skills, give students movement breaks, teach them to have a growth mindset, and learn to build like engineers. When we have successfully sent them home at 3 p.m., we go back to our classrooms, clean up the mess, reflect on what worked and didn't work, record data, meet with colleagues, answer emails, connect with parents and families, until we finally head home ourselves, usually with work that we weren't able to get to during the day. I love where I work, and I feel very proud when I say that I'm a Union 38 teacher. And as a teacher who puts her heart into her work, I expect a fair contract that reflects the work that I do day in and day out for this community. I ask for you, please, to work for a contract that starts to close the pay gap and one that we can all be proud of. Um, my name is Ryan Copeland. Um, this is my fourth year here as a classroom teacher. I actually hired the same summer that Sam was. Um, I've spent three years in sixth grade and one year in fifth. Um, and though I'm a relative newcomer to this district, I've worked in education for 16 years, beginning as a high school uh, student volunteering at a local after school program. Since then, I've worked in public schools in Seattle, Philadelphia, and most recently, Portland, Maine. I earned my master's degree from the Penn Graduate School of Education. And I've had the privilege to work with many talented and dedicated educators from the East Coast to the West Coast and back again. And I can say without hesitation that my colleagues here in Sunderland and Union 38 more generally are among the best. Since coming here, I've been continuously inspired by the commitment, passion, and expertise of Union 38 teachers. Here's a quick recent anecdote. Um, on New Year's Day, about three weeks ago, I drove to school, needing to do some work in my classroom to prepare for students coming the next day. There were at least seven vehicles in the parking lot, and I ran into five teachers within five minutes of being in the building. This was the last day of our vacation, the first day of the decade, and we were giving it to our students. Other folks more eloquent than I am, I am have already written or spoken about the plethora of hats that elementary educators wear, about how to be effective at this job, we must weave a tapestry of professional knowledge using threads from human development, social work, public policy, history, leadership, and pedagogy. And that's not even to mention our content area knowledge. Every day we develop lessons for reading, writing, math, science, social studies, and social emotional learning. And often within each of these content areas, we're developing multiple lessons in order to differentiate instruction for our diverse learners. In fact, it's not uncommon for us to write up to eight or 10 distinct lesson plans for just one day. And yet the role of an elementary educator remains so often misunderstood. Regardless of when and how the compensation gap between Union 38 and Frontier Regional educators came to be, here it is. And there are now more important questions. What will be done? Will there be a contract that represents a step in the right direction? Will there be a good faith offer that demonstrates not just appreciation, but respect and understanding? of the job that we do as professional elementary educators. Thank you. Hello, my name is Donna Carmody, and 
have been participating in this lovely Sunderland Elementary School community since 2011. Um, I have been a substitute teacher, an instructional assistant, a kindergarten teacher, and currently teach fourth grade. I also volunteer as a coach for the Sunderland Elementary Girls on the Run program, um, which has been a really special uh, opportunity. I believe that educating our children is one of the noblest professions there is in this world. We as teachers and caregivers shape the future of our society, our towns, our world. As a teacher, I help my students to recognize and take responsibility for their individual actions, and I help them to understand their responsibility in a larger community. They learn that every single person in a community has a civic duty. A duty to their families, their neighbors, their towns, their country. Each child takes turn leading the class meetings and navigating the many roles or jobs that we play in our classroom community, which also extend into the larger school community through participation in Veterans Day events, Sunderland and Action Day, as Sunderland athletes, in Girls on the Run community service projects, or through various other community events. And as a teacher, I cannot stand by and watch this inequity and injustice continue without speaking out. I ask you, how long would you continue to work in a job you love, in a community you love, once you knew that teachers in the same district were making at least 15% more than you were at the same scale? We're all on the same ladder. That is money that will allow you to quit the second job you have, just because you can't afford the health insurance for your family on your current teacher's salary. What would you do when you found out that a teacher on the same level of a scale, but working at the high school, made $5,281 more than you did last year, just because of where, the, of where they worked? Therefore, I ask you please, please work to close this gap and bring us all closer together in, in respect. Um, thank you so much for your time and willingness to listen. Julie Fallon and I currently teach second grade. Um, I've taught kindergarten, first, second, and third grade during my 20-year career at Deerfield Elementary School. I received my initial teaching license in 1988 from UMass where I studied early childhood education and psychology. Recently I completed a graduate level sheltered English immersion class that met on most Saturdays this fall at the Reading Institute at Mass MoCA and I've earned my endorsement. I spent most of our holiday recess working on my application to graduate school at UMass, where my objective is to earn a master's degree in social justice and education. For the last four years, I've served as a supervising practitioner to prospective teachers from UMass, welcoming student teachers into my class full time each spring. I consider it a privilege and an honor to give back in this way to a profession that I love. Union 38 elementary schools are very special places where students learn, grow, and thrive. Because we teach the youngest students in the district, our role as teachers is a fluid one, and writing a job description that encompasses all we do for children would be almost impossible. We're at once teachers, counselors, coaches, nurses, cheerleaders, and serve as daytime parents to our students teaching them not just academics, but tools for navigating life in an ever-changing world. How to tie a shoe, how to sneeze into your elbow, how to own mistakes, and how to treat everyone with dignity and respect. Last year, I was overjoyed to be invited to one of my former third graders' high school graduation. And I've also attended student birthday parties outside of school on the weekends, because I know how important it is to that student and because I care deeply about 
and work hard to build strong connections with every student I teach. I don't consider these acts to be extra. I consider them to be best practice in teaching. You see, teaching our youngest children is never just a job. It's part of who we are. It's part of our identity. And I know this is true for many of my colleagues in this room tonight. This fall, I became aware of a significant pay gap that exists between secondary and elementary teachers right here in our district. The data shows that when our students graduate and move on to middle and high school, where a majority of teachers are men, the opposite of what you see at the elementary level, they're paid more for teaching the same students and have more generous benefits. Why is this? Because that's the way it is and always has been? And if this is the case, why? The world has changed vastly over the last two decades. Teaching has changed vastly. We as teachers have worked diligently to embrace new curriculum and technologies to prepare our students to live in a global society. <coughs> as elementary teachers, we have done the work to ensure success in the 21st century learning standards for our students. Where is the pay that should accompany all of these changes? Do we really want to be a district that maintains antiquated values of compensating male teachers in high school more monetarily than their predominantly female counterparts in elementary school? It's time our pay scale is brought up to the 21st century standards. Tonight, I urge you, please support our teachers. Show that you value our work. Show that you value equity. Please close this gap. And thank you for listening, and thank you for all the service you provide to our district. speak respectfully and humbly. I do not live in this community. I live in Northampton. I teach and work in Conway. And I've been a teacher there, a sixth grade teacher for 25 years. For that whole 25 years, I've been aware of this discrepancy. When I got my job, I looked into the face of then Superintendent Welsh and then Principal Tim Luce and asked them why is there a discrepancy between the elementary teachers and the secondary teachers. The superintendent said, what you all have said is that mainly men work there, they're the primary breadwinner, and mainly women work at the elementary level, and they're the secondary breadwinner. That was 25 years ago. I've been teaching for 35 years. I taught in four other districts in the 10 years previous. None of those districts had this discrepancy. So I asked, why does this discrepancy exist? Um, for 25 years it's existed and it has actually widened. Whether that was de facto or intended is not really that pertinent. It exists and it shouldn't. And I was assured by that superintendent 25 years ago that that gap would be closed quickly when I said that, well, my wife and I are both elementary teachers, so we're both out of luck here. <laughs> and I even served to, uh, to, to uh, negotiate a contract uh, where those, the gap was still present and the effort to close it has been 25 years in the waiting. So I want to put that into perspective because you mentioned that it was just recently that you became aware of how large it correct. was. Correct. And I think people have long faces and sadness on their faces when they're sitting in this room hearing this. If you add, you know, $3,000 times 25, that's $75,000. Mm -hmm. That's more than I make in a year. And that's what represents the time of 25 years being underpaid. And if that's $4,000, then it's 100000 So that's why it's tough to take. I thank you for your service, for your ears.
a fellow school committee member, I understand the commitment that's involved in being of service to your community in this way. I'm addressing you tonight on the topic of equal pay for elementary and secondary educators in our district. My name is Sue O'Reilly McCray. I teach preschool in Conway. I've been there for, I think this is my 14th year, but I've been teaching for over 30 years. I'm speaking from the perspective of a long-time early childhood educator. Many years ago, our opening day speaker, a man from UMass, whose name I don't remember now, noted that education is piecework. Each child is individually gifted, challenged, motivated, interested, or disinterested in the tasks and skills required for their overall development. It's up to each teacher to build a relationship with each child that allows for that optimal development across a broad spectrum of skills year after year. Many children arrive in our district schools at the age of three. Our preschool teachers help our youngest learners orient to and learn to thrive in groups of a dozen or more children at a time. Also at this time, preschool teachers begin the work of bridging a child's home and school cultures. We partner with parents and we try to help them work through any lingering trauma from their own challenging school experiences. Parents who have struggled in school are often very anxious about starting this relationship. <coughs> we welcome them, we begin to build trust, and we work toward a shared understanding of each child's strengths and needs. We see them every day because most preschoolers do not arrive at school on a bus. Throughout the elementary years, our classroom teachers and specialists, art, music, PE, reading teachers, and special educators collaborate as we build our understanding of each child's needs and adjust our programs year after year to meet those needs. Foundational skills that support optimal learning in a school setting begin at home and in the community, even before the young age of three. In our district, we're very lucky to have many thriving families whose children come to school each day ready to partner with educators and eager to learn. We're also lucky to have the resources to support children and families who are struggling, either with disabilities or with the challenges of daily life. Working for what's best for each child, each family, happens every day at every grade level across our district. Why then does our compensation for elementary and secondary educators favor secondary educators with a higher pay scale? What justifies that? It implies that secondary educators are providing a service to children and families that is of greater value. This makes no sense. There is a preponderance of research that supports the idea that a child's early learning years lay the foundation for and predict later development. That said, elementary educators in our district are not requesting that we flip the pay model. We're asking for parity, for justice. Our district is thriving, while other districts around us are struggling, in large part because of the families and communities that support our work as educators, but also because of the skill and dedication of educators at all 14 grade levels, preschool through 12th grade. Please recognize our shared commitment to our district's success with a pay scale that treats every educator's pay rate equally, adjusted for years of experience, no matter what grade level they teach. Thank you for listening. Did Wendy Poole leave? She had her hand up. I'd love to hear from a parent. She has to go back to work. She's gone. She's gone. She had to go to work. I'll be a future parent. Great. My name is Kara, and I live in Sunderland, Mass. And I have a one and a two year old who will be attending Sunderland Elementary, and I look forward to that day. And what I'm hearing is a lot of defeat and frustration, and I also see lots of dollar signs, and we can't solve this with money. So I encourage all of you to think outside of the box and how can you make this right? If you can't give money, what can you give? What can you do? This problem needs to be addressed. Thank you. for coming out. Thank you to everybody who spoke tonight. Thank you to everybody who's been sending us emails. Um, I want you all to know that we are hearing you. Um, I've been hearing lots of really great points. I've been hearing 
um, that teaching has been changing, um, that kids are coming to school less ready to learn, that teachers have extra responsibilities and expectations, and they haven't been compensated for that as that has shifted over time. I've been hearing how extremely hard our teachers work, way beyond what's suggested by the minimums in our contract, um, and that the impact of what our teachers are doing lasts a lifetime, if not several generations within a family. I'm hearing that a lot of our teachers have to work second jobs, which I understand takes their time and energy away from their classrooms and their own families, which is not really who we want to be. Um, and I'm hearing that this period of disparity with Frontier is deeply painful, is an issue of equity and justice. Um, I'm a public school teacher. I'm certified K-12. I have taught all but one grade from preschool through 12th grade. It is not easier to teach elementary school. Um, I first engaged with this school committee a year ago um, before I was on it. I showed up, I was the only person here for public comment because I had noticed in our town annual report where we had both salary schedules and I sort of reflexively looked at my own position, what would I be making? Wow, I'd be making more at Frontier. I showed up here a year ago to talk to the school committee about it um, and ask questions. I, I feel like that disparity is wrong. I'm already in public record from before I was a school committee member, so my, per my personal feelings about it, I can, I can freely say. Um, I believe that paying teachers less than their secondary counterparts is wrong. I believe we're here to do what's best for students, and generally speaking, what's best for students is also what's best for teachers. Um, can I also respond a little bit about our financial situation? Sunderland is in a somewhat unique financial position that I don't think has ever been explained to the union. Can I take it? I mean, feel free. Yeah. Um, so there's three things I want to tell you about our financial position. One of them is the boring one about tax rates and overrides. But by state law, we can't increase our property taxes more than 2.5% a year unless we get an exception. Asking the voters for that exception is called an override. Three years ago, we asked, Sunderland had an override and it failed by 14 votes. Two years ago, we put up another override and I, was, I worked with other parents in the PTO to call every registered voter who's a parent at SES using the PTO directory. And we, we got parents to the polls, we passed that override by 40 something votes. And then last year, there was a major budget crisis here and I don't know how well the news of that actually penetrated into the teacher culture. Um, but several things happened at once. We graduated a small class. The sixth grade was only one classroom and then we needed to hire a new teacher. Um, our, uh, we graduated some high tuition special needs students from out of town without replacing that revenue. Um, and our school choice money was down because we've got more families moving to Sunderland because our schools are so wonderful. Um, taking up more seats so we can't take more paying kids from other towns. And there were other things going on. All of this added up to, what was it, an 8.4% increase? Way beyond what was allowed. And this school committee ultimately voted unanimously to put up a, to support a school budget that required a second override in a row, which is incredibly unusual. I did some digging into the state data, and um, in the last decade, only 14 towns out of 351 have passed two overrides in a row. Sunderland is one of them. There's only one other in the Pioneer Valley. That's incredibly rare. Um, I'm telling you this not just be so that you understand our limitation, um, but also so that you can see the areas where the teachers have been supported because when they were looking at that 8.4% budget increase, they also had to look at what would, we, what would it look like if we didn't go for this override? What, what would it look like if we brought it down towards 2.5%? They actually, I think, couldn't get it under 2.5%, is that right? Um, but doing that required cutting several IAs and taking IA support out of the classrooms. And it required getting rid of all art, music, strings, band, the Spanish program, which ultimately didn't survive last year's budget. Um, that meant that teachers would lose a, lose a prep period, classroom teachers would lose a prep period, and for some of their prep period, other prep periods during the week, the kids would be doing some activities supervised by IAs. Our IAs are amazing. And doing that is not the same as having a structured lesson with a, a certified teacher. That would impact your kids all day long. And this committee said, this is not acceptable for our teachers or our kids. And they stood up unanimous, unanimously to say, we need this for the schools. Um, at the same time, I worked with some other parents. The PTO, again, did their thing of calling all of the parents who were registered to vote. But on top of that, um, I worked with two other parents 
and I, they, they gave me permission to tell you who they are, um, Ellie Kurth and Nathaniel Waring. For two months, the three of us knocked on doors every weekend. We registered dozens of new voters. Um, we took the information of anybody who said they would support the override. And with the PTO team that was, that was larger, we got people to the polls last year's override passed. Um, so I, I want you to see all those levels of support, the voters who came to the polls on, sa on a Saturday in May, the parents who dedicated their weekends for two months, working parents like you, um, and the school committee that went out on that limb and said to the select board and the finance committee and town meeting, we really need this. And I said three things. That was the boring one. Um, <laughs> state money. We just passed in Massachusetts a major bill to bring lots more money to towns for education. A year ago, the MTA forecasted that Sunderland was going to get $140,000, almost, just under. Um, when that bill passed, things changed. Sunderland's now getting $6,000, which for context is not even half of an IA position. Um, and then the third thing was about the future. I think we have a majority of Sunderland teachers here who probably know our current fifth grade is just one classroom, all of our other grades are two classrooms. When that class graduates, we are going to not only have to hire a new teacher, we don't have a place to put them. There's no solution to that problem that's free. Um, so I want you to know that the financial decisions that the school committee has to make are really difficult. And I think I can speak for everybody at this table that we really deeply value educators, elementary educators. Um, and that if our gratitude could pay our bills, if our gratitude could pay your orthodontics bills, we could all leave here happy. Um, but we are very much constrained by these numbers that we are working and standing up to change. Um, this board has been showing support for teachers in some very important ways that I think makes teachers' jobs more realistic and manageable. But also, I hear you that teacher pay is an important leg of support that has been neglected and needs some attention. Um, so thank you all for coming out and for raising your very important points and engaging with this process. We appreciate your voices. My name is Peter Giger, and I've been on the school committee for a couple of years. Um, I've been involved in other stuff in town going back three decades or more. I used to run the finance committee in town. I was on the committee that built the new library. I still call it new, even though now it's 15 years old um, in town. And I had always been interested in the school committee, even though I have no kids and I have no grandkids. And I'm way older than anyone else in this room. And I just think Sunderland is a great town. Um, I realize you've got a union that covers four towns. Um, but my experience is with Sunderland, and um, I think it's a wonderful town. I think it's got a wonderful town government. Most of you don't have to deal with that, but I've dealt with it over years, and we have a way of doing things in this town that is, it just works really well. And if you ever have ideas about what government ought to be, I think you look at Sunderland and you see what, you know, what it is at its best. Um, and I also think we got a wonderful school. And part of the reason I got on the school committee at this point in my life was because I think it's important for Sunderland to have as good a school as it can possibly have. Um, most of you in this room, I don't know. You have teachers at the school, I don't know, I'm sorry, but it's just the way it is. On the other hand, it's been real nice to sit here and listen to the way you present, the way you uh, express yourselves, uh, the uh, points you make in, in, in support of the positions, the different ways it's done. And I'm, with each one of you, I'm impressed. Boy, there's somebody that understands communication, um, that understands you know, how to deal in situations where people may have different points of view. The first thing is you try and communicate, and you try and communicate honestly. Um, and that's clearly been the case this evening, and, and thank you for doing that. Uh, one of my things on the committee is that I think the school, this is the largest building in town, it's the most active building in town, it's the largest share of the town budget, um, and therefore I, I think it, it's absolutely in everybody's interest, the school's interest and the town's interest, that we do as good a job of communicating with the rest of town government as is possible. Often schools you know, operate in their own universes, and um, I think that's a mistake. I think that. Uh, there's so many ways that if we have good 
communication, if we have good uh, uh, trust, if we have credibility, if we have openness and transparency in dealing with the select board, the finance committee, and just the residents in town of town in general, then that's to everyone's benefit. And so um, I have in, honestly enjoyed listening to uh, the various comments and the way you expressed yourselves and the, and the way you made your points. And I say, boy, I said, we got some good students coming out of this system and we certainly got some good educators uh, that are uh, making that possible. Um, as Jessica said, uh, the big challenge in uh, uh, being on this side of the table is the same challenge the administration faces, and they face it every day. We don't, you know, they're the ones that really run this place, but we we have our role, and the problem is always you don't have as many resources as you wish you had. Okay, and those resources are personnel, their time, and their money. Okay, and so part of what I uh, do myself to try and help out is how can we figure out how to get more resources? How can we figure out how to use what resources we have better? Okay, and you know, looking at how can we do things better? It's continual, and I think that's actually it's both necessary and it's good because the school, you know, you got to keep changing. I mean, it's funny having someone real old sitting and saying this because usually the old people are the ones that resist change. But sorry, the world keeps changing. You got to change with it. And I, I hear from people this evening said. You know, education's, elementary education is not like it used to be. Things change. The students come in and are different. And all that. Yeah, absolutely. And so we hear this side of the table. We got to keep thinking about how can we do things not only differently, but also better. So that, you know, all of this stuff is challenges. And, you know, if it was easy, as I say, if it was easy, it would already be done. If it was easy, you know, we'd have a contract and we wouldn't be messing with this stuff. And I'm not on the negotiating committee and I'm not involved in, in the details there. Um, but in listening to you all tonight, I will echo what I wrote down here, just a note that I believe Donna said at the end. Uh, thank you so much for your time and willingness to listen. And I will just say thank you so much for your time and willingness to come here and talk to us. Because just communicating, it's, it gives me a different sense of, of, uh, of what this whole issue is. And, and thank you for that. Um, I, I certainly hope we can we can make some progress here, but you know, it's I'm one vote. Okay, this is uh, uh, but again, I just want to say appreciate you all coming. Uh, I'd like to reiterate. I, I appreciate everybody coming out. I appreciate um, the comments you made. Uh, I want to reassure everybody that your voices are being heard. We hear them clearly. Um, you do a great job. Both of my kids have come through here and were engaged and prepared when they left. And what you talk about, uh, the amount of time that you put on the weekends and extra time, I see it from my wife as well. She's an elementary school teacher in Deerfield. And it's the same thing that you're saying. Nights, weekends, holidays, it's a lot of work. Um, this is an important issue, it is. It's come up before, it's a, it's a, it's a gender equity issue. It's, it's an issue of social justice. Um, it's also, uh, there's a financial issue as well. It's difficult financially, Peter and, and Jessica spoke to that as well. Um, but it's my sincere hope that the negotiation, what I understand between the negotiation team and the, the uh, union leadership is that the chasm is not huge. That, there, that it is growing smaller and that it can get done. It's my hope that it does get done uh, soon. Uh, it is a step towards a more equitable and, and uh, fair contract. I, I appreciate, from what I've heard, the understanding of the, the financial situations of all the towns, that this is not necessarily going to get done in one contract, but it's my sincere hope that uh, both the, the union and the negotiation team not only work to, to solve this contract, but also plan ahead and put in steps to make sure that in the very near future that that gap is closed. It's going to take a lot of planning, but I hope it gets done. So my name is Dr. Maisie Duralaman Shaw. Um, I know many of you here. I'm here every day. All three of my girls go here. Um, I sit on this committee because I believe in public education and I believe in this school. 
I believe in it so strongly because I am a statistic that just isn't probable and it's because of the public school that I attended. Um, I have a PhD and the people that come from my school just shouldn't. We don't. I hear you. Um, Donna, you asked what would you do? I, I resigned when I found out and I was a teacher at Mount Holyoke College in a very similar situation with a colleague and I chose to leave. I don't want you to choose to leave. <laughs> don't, please. Please. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. It's just what I did. Um, we hear you. We appreciate you coming. Um, and we're just one role in how this budget gets funded. But we are happy to advocate. Thank you. Greg Gottschalk, um, I also have three girls who are either in or have been through this school. Um, so much has already been said. Um, I am encouraged when I hear people understanding that it may take multiple contracts uh, to work this out where everyone feels like they're getting a fair shake. Um, and this, is, this is a lot of support. This is a lot of people coming out. Uh, and I, I hear the personal stories about the, the benefits. Um, it has to be understood that some of this stuff works through the towns, so there's a lot of uh, intricacies to, to understand where do you get your benefits from versus where do you get your, you know, uh, versus the contract stuff. Um, so by all means, I'm not discouraging anyone. I'm saying take, take the message on to, to uh, the forums where, where this kind of stuff can get solved. Um, and uh, all I can say is I feel like understanding the constraints, understanding the expenses we've already signed up for, uh, speaking as someone who's on the negotiating team, uh, I will say that we are what may not seem like a good faith effort to put out uh, the best offer that we can in understanding the issues we're having with a boiler now, with uh, a frozen... Uh, a compressor that's uh, broken and we've, we've lost thousands of dollars in frozen food. This, this school is fragile. And uh, you know everything that's been said about uh, the town growing and displacing choice money that's been coming in is true. Uh, the habit of funding, uh, using choice money a year in arrears and being able to have that cushion, that's gone. Um, so I, I hear what's been said. I'm grateful for everything you guys are doing. And I hope you'll understand that we're doing the best to get you the best contract we can afford without crashing the system. This is just a building without teachers, whether the boiler works or not. Yeah. You say don't quit, you better watch. I'm sorry if I antagonized anyone with that. That wasn't my intent. It was I'm just trying to share perspective. I will say that at the time that I've been on the school committee, that the constant refrain has always been, uh, I feel like we've been trying to tackle things that have been um, kicked down the road for a long time. Uh, this is my second term on it, and the first term going into the second term was, we have to stop kicking this down the road, we have to stop kicking this down the road, we have to stop kicking this. And I feel like that much of the time has been spent trying to stop kicking things down the road. And, and my hope is that uh, I think we've been fairly successful doing that so far, and I hope that we can continue not kicking anything down the road as well. This is one of them that's important, and I think that's that's the belief of everybody on this committee. I think um, Ben Barshevsky, principal. I think the the consistent theme that we see across all four of our elementary schools, um, a, as we do our walkthroughs throughout the years, the passion and love that's found in each each classroom. Um, Deerfield resident. I have two girls, father, proud father, two girls, one of which will be attending kindergarten at Deerfield next year, look out, um, Deerfield teachers. Um, but uh, your, your love, your dedication, the effort you put forth on a, on a daily basis is so very much, much appreciated and, it, and it's noticeable. And it's noticeable from the smiles on the kids' faces, how proud our parents are to send the, our kids to these schools. So keep up the great work and it's, your efforts are just routinely in, regularly applauded. You're, you're appreciated.
guess that's it for public comment. Thank you all. You all can stay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to the budget, you have an understanding of our... No, but, you know, there'll be other meetings when it's nice to have public support for the budget. And So basically, we have been for about 25 more minutes or 20 minutes when we get together here. 15 minutes? Not 15. All right, so we've been for 15 minutes, so I'd love to do um, budget, budget and capital good. projects. I can handle capital projects. We have pre meeting, but I'd love to do it for budget. So we'll go straight into that and then bounce around from there. That'd be great. So there's one of each of these for you? Three documents total. Those are mine. Yes. So you have a narrative summary, and then you have um, what looks like an Excel sheet. It's got a line by line summary of each of the changes within the total budget, and then you have the full budget uh, printout as well. This is just our first draft. Um, obviously, I was not here last year. This is my first go around at this, but I do understand from what I've heard that this budget that's being presented puts us in a better position than the initial budget we started with last year. Um, however, we do also recognize that we still have work to do, because you will see if you flip to uh, the last page of the larger sheet or look on either of the summaries, we're currently at an increase of 8.32%. Uh, or $245,882. Uh, so some of the work that we did ahead of time was to look at expenditures of actuals from the prior three years, as well as taking input from principal and department head in regards to operational and programmatic really needs over wants. Um, this, this list that was produced by um, administration was really things that need to either get back into the budget or things that needed to be added to meet the needs of current students. Uh, we have accounted for wage and salary increases for IAs based on the existing contract um, and teachers based on a potential contract negotiation. Um, obviously, we're not through that process yet, but we did want to um, earmark some funds, as well as uh, wage increases for non-union personnel, such as central office staff, principal secretaries, and custodians. Um, we'll use additional funding sources as we have in other years, revolving funds, school choice funds, uh, but at, that at this time we're still working to iron out all of those details and we'll provide you an update at a future meeting. So I want to quickly go over, uh, please stop me if you have questions too, and I tend to talk fast, so just tell me to slow down if needed. Um, on that summary narrative page, I want to point out that there is not change to most of these budget items. If you look on the line by line page, there's a zero change on at least half of these items and the primary changes are salary related across the board as I discussed above. There's also not a lot of reductions because there isn't an opportunity to reduce a whole lot more. There are a few reductions listed on that um, page, uh, line by line page, um, but there's really not a whole lot of movement there. We're not looking to make any dramatic changes or cuts as I understand things have been slumped pretty down, down pretty far in the last couple of years. Um, we did have a couple of expenditures that were omitted from the FY20 budget. Um, I can't speak to why they were, but I did discover that they were, so I had to add those back in. There were no funds for school committee legal expenses. Um, that one's not really explainable, but we did move some money around and we're able to cover that for FY20, but we have to add it back in for FY21. 
And then uh, I believe everybody is aware of the trash expense that came up this year after the budget was already approved. So that has also been <coughs> back in here. Uh, teacher mentor stipends, this amount was in addition to the budget. Uh, this, these funds were previously paid from the REAP grant. Um, we're looking to move those to local budget if possible so that we don't have to continue to rely on grant funding for something that is a year-to-year -year expense. Uh, there was a minor increase for nature's classroom, as we anticipate there'll be more fifth graders next year. Um, is could, you, could you just say the number out loud as you're talking? Yeah, about sure. The audience, yep. the, the numbers are here. Um, so the nature's classroom increase was $500. And the teacher staff was 5200 Yep. <clears throat> uh, so we have a new key fob system here. Is it complete, Ben, at your school? No, the wiring's being run. Okay. So when that system is complete, uh, that was funded by a grant this year. However, we will have to maintain that system moving forward, even though it is a brand new system. We do expect that there may be some costs that come up with maintenance. And uh, so we added $1,500 to cover the cost of maintenance of that security system. In the custodial line, we increased by $3,000 to allow for summer custodial support. I know when I first started last summer, this was an area of big discussion uh, because there were services needed and funds were not necessarily available. Uh, so Ben wanted to make sure that that was allocated back into the budget. Building general repairs, we increased slightly by $2,950, $2,950, uh, due to increased repairs year after year. We're consistently talking about things that need to be updated or have broken in this building this year. That seems to be a consistent theme, so just added a small amount of money in there. Uh, teacher salaries, uh, we're anticipating an increase of approximately $70,000 based on a potential contract settlement and column or step changes. There are several teachers with column changes next year, and um, if you are not on the highest step, any teacher will move up a step. Um, IA wages, we have an approximate increase of $10,000 based on the settled contract and step changes. Another uh, big hit to the budget this year is the staffing for speech and physical therapy have previously been paid out of the special education revolving fund. However, there has been discussion that that fund cannot continue to support those wages. So that is an increase of $45,000 to the general fund as we need to absorb those salaries back in. And uh, finally, a uh, wage increase for the non-union personnel, as mentioned earlier, central office staff, custodian, secretaries, principal. Um, there's not a number on this yet. I'm still working on that. It falls into several line items, so I have to manually calculate that out. I will have an update for you at the next meeting, but I didn't want to throw something at you today that wasn't fully comprehensive. Um, obviously, you know, we haven't had a discussion yet about those wage increases either. Uh, the next piece uh, I'm going to allow Ben to speak to if you have questions or if he'd like to elaborate a little bit considering that it's positions added. Mm -hmm. um, so there has been a request to add a team leader which would be added to the teacher contract and a potential salary of $55,000 and then uh, two new IAs, instructional assistants, added for a potential increase of $44,000 to the budget. Do you want to talk about sure, and um, so as we've been adding classrooms over the past few years with one sixth grade class leaving and two kindergarten classes coming in, we've added classroom teachers um, and uh, not only has student numbers increased but so have the overall needs um, and the, significant of the significance of those needs. So we are looking to add a team leader position um, uh, to be a member of our special education team in, in the building. Um, additionally, um, we are anticipating um, additional needs in early childhood. Um, at th students can come into the preschool starting at 2.9, and so as the school year has progressed, um, we are getting a few new students in um, this, this spring that will need additional support. Um, and then we also have um, uh, some students who need require one-on-one uh, -on -one support as well, and so that's where those those positions are um, are geared towards. So a couple things is obviously I think within this budget prep process, um, I know an eight point three is not going to fly. We, we're not, but it, in order for us, I think it's important to show the transparency of what Ben's asking for 
what I believe are genuine needs in this building. Um, and some of them are going to be, some of those needs are drawn by special education needs, which we're going to have to reorganize staff if we can't get this kind of staffing. Um, but I also know there's nowhere really else to cut. And so we did a kind of general, because I know the question's also, I understand there's also the, in the air of how can you add positions when we're talking about contracts and you know, it's inflating, that kind of thing. But if you remove those two positions, which I think, again, I think are very, those three positions rather, they're very much needed. The number is at 4.9, is that what you told me earlier really today? Is at 4.9%, which is still, um, without the additions of those positions, and as you look at the budget, there's not a whole lot of, you know, $3,000 for custodial services or, you know, that kind of thing. You're still talking about, we're still not within the range that the select boards and want us to be in, um, or the finance committees and want us to be in, and um, it would be closer to three. And so you can look at the bottom where each percentage point in our contract, and then our contract, each percentage point in the budget is $30,000, just short thereof. Mm -hmm. So you can see that, you know, we're, we're really looking at having to drop the, this particular budget by, and I know I quickly, and Ben's going to be upset at me, but I quickly just kind of got rid of additions. You know what I mean? But I don't, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and kind of look about how we can prioritize and move things around. Um, we'll have to also, we'll firm up the school choice numbers. We have had an increase in school choice revenues. Um, so and how can we, we're going to put things, what we don't want to do, but we're going to have to do it to some level, put things back onto school choice to some amount. So I'm going to kind of jump in because these are kind of summaries of our conversations earlier today. So it's, it's going to be tricky because we have to keep some savings in school choice um, or else we're going to get in the position we were in last year where we have to get bailed out if there's any fluctuations in school choice and any school choice special needs. And so, so yeah, it, it, it's, gonna, it's, a, it's not last season's difficult budget season, but we're not out of the woods yet. And when you look at the overall, the increases, it's, it's, it's salaries, salaries across the board. And it, and it always, it is, it's, it has been year after year, and this is no year, this year is no different than anything else. Um, um, in the sense of how do you grow a budget yeah, where the majority of your budget is salary, yet the confines of the state says you can't move it more than two and a half percent per year. So that's kind of, that's the, that's the, the math problem that have, you know, we've, been, we've been having this discussion about that is very difficult. Each year, the majority of any kind of changes, salary, just keeping the salary of the, student, of, the, of the faculty and staff that you have. And then, as you know, was said earlier by Jessica, we also have other looming problems. Of, we'll talk about some of our capital, some of our things are breaking now because we've been... And the building's older. The building's getting older. Things are getting end of life. And we can't put money aside for that because we can barely keep up with the money toward all the other things, you know, keeping things moving, progressing forward at reasonable rates. And I'm not saying, you know, the, the growth of the, the contracts and um, those on contract and those without contracts are not unreasonable. Um, I'm just saying that in the confines of trying to do that around three around three percent with the town is where we're stuck. And in, um, in, in regards to the um, requested positions, these are it's not want based, it's, it's need based and our special education team it works very, very hard, yet they're stretched so thin, working across multiple grade levels, um, a, a big continuum of needs and they are, they are running day in and day out and going above and beyond. Um, and if you look at uh, schools with similar um, student population and similar needs, there are additional special education positions that exist in the building. So this is bringing us closer to what what those um, like platforms look like in those schools. Easy chair. <laughs> yeah. Well, next Peter. A um, couple things. Uh, one is I'm assuming that there's nothing in here uh, that would be for um, possible additional costs of students coming from the development that's going to be coming online this summer on the south end of town. Correct. We did not budget for an influx larger than what we're already providing. Right. Meaning we're not adding any classes in anticipation of a population. Program. Right. Or, you know, we're not, we're not making any, any sort of 
allowance for increased busing costs, increased special ed costs, increased number of students, that, you know, whatever. I'm, you know, particularly I'm thinking, if you look at our classroom size uh, through the different grades, there's room in most grades for, you know, some modest number of increased students. Um, and, you know, you might well be able to figure out a way to do it without increased busing costs, but I would think that the moment you start getting any kids, you're going to start ratcheting up your sped costs um, that would, you know, not be absorb absorbable within the current. Fair system. statements. I mean, we projecting based on the other other um, apartment building complex and the percentage of students that we get from each, we think we can absorb if it follows the same patterns right. of those other complexes. Right. So we looked at that. But, you know, if everybody moves in as a fourth grader but, 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 all at but, once, then, you know what I mean, statistically it doesn't fit, but it would cause a problem where we would be talking about it. Right, but even if we get a number of students that, you know, suppose you get 20 students, but they fit out so that, you know, okay, they, you know, you've got room in the grades that are coming in, and you don't have to you have more transportation costs for whatever reason, so on. Of those 20, they're going to be spread costs just on law of averages, and that's not built in. Correct. And so that, that leads me to my second sort of general point, which is that I realize that there are matters of confidentiality involved, particularly, okay, but is there a way of educating the other player, you know, both this committee, myself, and the other players, you know, in town government, about the SPED program in a way that doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't, you know, get us into questions about privacy, confidentiality, and so on. Because much as I've looked at this stuff, okay, and I haven't been doing this forever, but it's, you know, I've, I've got some awareness of, of what it is. I still don't feel comfortable with understanding, you know, I, all I know is it's a really expensive dealing with all these issues because the kids are coming in with incredible needs and we're trying to satisfy them and we're sometimes we're having trouble satisfying them and therefore possibly need for two more positions and so on. And I look at it and I say, can we do a better job of communicating the argument for why this costs so much? and why we're asking still for more resources for doing it. Because that's a chunk of the increase. It's, it's, both a, it's both, even if you weren't asking for this stuff, still just because, you know, a standard sort of concern, oh, you spend so much for SPED that people don't understand it. You know, I mean, until you start actually looking at the situations, you understand why you've got to do it. But when you're talking to people, you know, like the select board and finance and the, you know, residents of town and so on, um, I'm just thinking that we, can we do a you know, better, much better job of somehow, you know, making it understandable, okay, for people who, you know, can't know certain stuff, okay, and, and maybe don't understand how some of the stuff, you know, takes so much teacher time or so much IA time or stuff like this. And can we, can we make it understandable? Because if we can't, boy, it gets a lot harder to sell this stuff. It gets a lot harder to sell why you need, you know, a team leader and two IAs on a program that a lot of people would say it already is spending way too much on. Okay, so I'm just thinking from a straight how you, you know, how you get people on board for the kinds of things you need. Something like that, I would think, would help. It would almost be like, you know, yeah, you've got to do that. And then you see, well, hopefully it helps. I mean, you never know, but it's got to be worth trying. And I don't know enough about the, you know, because I can't, you can't talk to me about the ins and outs of these particular things and so on, but, you know, I think that's part of your job is to come up with a way of, you know, making it understandable. Because it's, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a sales pitch, basically, but there's got to be a way that's, that's both honest, realistic, you know, and gets people to understand, yeah, you want a good school, this is what you got to provide for resources. Ben, you mentioned like a couple of platforms. Or you mentioned the, the, the comparison to, you mentioned a couple of platforms so that, yeah. that could be used as a comparison. I think having that to present to uh, finance or stuff or would be mm -hmm. along the lines of what Peter is saying. And then when you say, and, you know, and, and another thing that, that I've heard, you know, the, the standard complaint is, well, you know, here's something that's got to go in the general budget because we don't have money for it. In the, it's been paid for by a grant or by a revolving fund and we don't have the money there. Okay. That needs to be clear cut spelled out why that has become the case. 
okay? And we went through this whole thing with school choice last year, okay, in terms of why is there suddenly, you know, you're asking for a whole lot more money funded by the town, and you're saying, well, it, you know, because we don't have near as much school choices at, at, to apply to the budget as we had even just the year before. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure you all remember that took, you know, right from the, right from February, we're getting selectmen to come to our meetings so they understood, you know, that this was, you know, they understood the problem, they understood how bad the problem was, and they were in on it, you know, basically at the same time we were, okay, and then they get, you know, they got invested in helping to solve it, okay, as long as this Fed stuff is a mystery, and I say it's a mystery, I mean, it's, I, we, the reasons why you can't go into details on stuff, but you still, we still got to do a much better job of explaining, you know, not only, you know, why these additions are, are reasonable for the program we're trying to run, you know, why the stuff where you're saying, oh, this, this, this revolving fund, if you just say revolving fund can't handle it anymore, okay, we don't have money, that's, that to me is not enough. We've got to do a better job at sort of like, you know, a little bit of the history, and I think we went through that with the school choice thing. I mean, we were really saying, you know, this is like over the last six, eight, ten years, that we, we essentially, the big override didn't pass back you know, nine, ten years ago, and so the only way we could survive was keep chopping down the school choice money available until we, you know, and suddenly we were like, you know, well below zero. Okay. So I, again, I'm just throwing this out in terms of how we, how we go through the next couple of months in terms of both developing this here, but more importantly, you know, getting a case that you can then get other people to buy into. Now, the one, you know, the one offset to the possibility that we may get more expensive dealing with a new development is a town that, you know, at some point, I have to find out, I can't quite remember the exact schedule it happens on, at some point, the town's going to get some more taxes from that. Okay? And everybody's going to want their share, you know, I mean, the, you know, the highway department's got stuff they need, and we have, I mean, it's all, you know, and, and there's going to be a lot of caution in terms of, you know, you, how you commit those resources. But that will be out there, and the question is, you know, we've got to make a real good case if we want to um, tap into that. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that I could uh, defend like a 4 or 5% increase as well. I, I don't think we gave the select board any indication last year that with, with the help that they gave us, that all the problems were going to be solved and we were going to roll in with a 2% budget this year. I think we were pretty clear that this is a multi-year situation that we needed to dig ourselves out of. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be a 2% a, like a, a increase. We took one step last year and it's going to be, we're going to have to pay for it this year and we're going to have to pay for it going forward in order to move that stuff off of school choice onto the general budget. Just to clarify, it sounds like we're not prepared for a big influx of special needs, but you projected so, proportional to what you're yeah, so any, already, any, so any kind of new, um, you know, new students who may require additional services is always, it's always kind of a, it's a, it's a crapshoot right. anytime. Anytime right. you're getting any new students in any, and especially in smaller schools mm -hmm. where their needs may be higher than what's budgeted. I mean, it's a very, I mean, you could. I mean, you technically could have a student move into your district that costs a hundred thousand dollars. You know what I mean? And so, and it's happened in our districts in the, since I've been here, where, where of course there's circuit breaker that helps you That's the first right. year, yeah, yeah. the following year is going to, you know, you know, is going to, is, you're going to get hit. So, it's. So we're always one of those things, but you can't overly prepare. You that's, know what I mean? That's kind of what so you, you do have to kind of. I don't feel like this is leaving us exposed. I know. Let's put it this way. Uh, we know we got to work on the eight percent, mm -hmm. but if you were to get it, I'm, I don't think that we are. If you got it, you would be unduly exposed. The question is. Well, so I guess that becomes what the question is. So I mean, I what I was saying in the beginning with is that eight percent is that that's not an easy number. Yeah. That's you know, there has there's things in here that can be we can tighten up on, and then we have to kind of decide prioritizing if we're going to try to expand and looking at the. You know how much money do we want to take off of school choice to help us? Because we we do should offset some support level of the budget with the school choice, but at the same time that is the cushion to when you have a special needs student or a student who requires other services or any other needs 
that we'll talk about capital needs where you can pay all those capital needs out of school choice. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it just becomes, school choice is a turn into our, a, a little safety net bank so that you don't have to do, you know, if the boiler blows and you have no school choice money and you have no other money, then you have to cut in the middle of each school year. That's the only other spot you're gonna save money. And other school districts have done it around us where you have mid-year layoffs because you don't have enough money. Oh, yeah. But that's why it's important to keep some money in school choice so that you, you have your program that carries through the school year with consistency for the kids and obviously and it's consistent for the kids as well as consistency for the staff and that kind of thing. So that's kind of what's important so to we're going to be rebuilding our choice more slowly than we might like. So our, our, right. Our choice money is, you know, all the mud, all the cherry sheets come out at the end of the month, but you know, we have the early projections. If we're going through by hand, going through to make sure that the state is correct, because we also got burned where somebody was on the list. We, it happened in two different Two different um, schools in this district, in the larger district, we'll call it that, um, where one school had a re had three kids reporting, and no, 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 they had moved, and they were wrongly reported by the sending school or by the other school. And we also had one that was here that we thought was not here. You know, saying we were paying out for school choice when we thought they had moved, mm -hmm. and so they corrected back. So it's one of those things where you kind of, when the school district decide, we go through by hand. Principal looks at it, you can have the secretary look at it, because sometimes they even have more knowledge about kids and going and coming. Um, so we'll make sure that that number at the end of the month is correct. And then once we have that number, we'll decide how we're going to, how much we can use here and there. And then there's some other funds that we can look at. We're also gonna be looking at the, you know, what the SPED revolving numbers are. And that's some money to get back from the state regarding special ed needs. And so all of them will help, because you know, we're talking about $30,000 percentage points. You know, we can we can we can kind of bring that down. But I, I was just trying to expose right from the beginning. I want to be very transparent about what are the additional staffing is and their costs. Not to cut it first, but I want to be very transparent because of the guests we have in the room. I've just heard I've heard from on the side of people, you know, well, how can you increase when this other thing's going on? Well we have to show our need. But I also I don't want to just inflate that numbers that says, hey, show we see we can't afford it. I wanted to show that's why I was giving both those numbers. So I mean, I want to be fair. I want to be transparent. Those are the numbers. <clears throat> so, this is what I have for a game plan moving forward for this budget. Is that we're going to take it back and refine it with the other numbers. We're probably going to need an additional meeting in February um, because it's going to probably take it to. I mean, we need a reading and then a, before we bring it, you know, bring it forward. Um, I think that's that's kind of where we're at. It's, uh, it's not as refined as some of the other budgets. It's because there's going to have to be some either tightening of the belt or being creative about how we approach things. And that takes getting everybody involved in doing that. Can I just request that if it if it's works for you, I mean, for me, if, I, you know, if you're going to be putting something in front of us at any one of these meetings and you've got it ready 24 hours in advance and can send it electronically. Mm -hmm. It means I come here and I've read the thing rather than trying to listen to you and read the thing at the same time. And yep. it just makes it much more sensitive without we're making, we can, we can make more progress in a meeting. And I, and I, and I, and I would definitely want to hear ideas about how we present the whole special ed program to select yeah, I mean, my, my concern on that is that one, it's people are going to believe what they want to believe, and we can try to sway one way, but I don't want this this budget to be on the backs of a certain population of mm -hmm. students because all the students cost money. I, I'm, just, the I'm cost. just thinking that the more we educate them, the more we have them understand, and so right. on. Okay, I mean, I just saw last year, okay, and right. we went from February when it's like you know, outrageous what we're proposing, proposing for a budget, okay, to town meeting when we've got unanimous support sure. from select board and finance, because they've been, uh, you know, the communication has been good to them, and they understood that we weren't just BS. Right. Okay, and um, I think there's a way to do, let me put it this way, I think there's a way to do a better job on the Fed side of it than we're doing. There may still be real limitations of what you can do. There may be hesitation because you don't want to feel like, oh, you know, everybody blames the SPED thing. You know, it's a, it's a, it's You're talking a, about a better job of communicating? Communicating, to of them, communicating them so that they understand why there's the need. Right. Okay. And so that they understand also 
that that um, you know part of it is being about where we have paid for stuff from grants or revolving funds and we can't any longer. It's, part, it's just doing a good job of communicating so you understand, yeah, we're not BSing you. Okay. You know, this is just the reality. We tried to save the town from, you know, we funded this stuff from grants and, and revolving funds as long as we could, okay, because that was saving uh, money from the town general fund. I think you would want us to do that, fine. The money's run out. You just have to have the communication, the transparency, the credibility so that when you say that, they believe you. They don't think the guy's BS. Okay, and I think we're I think we do a good job of that. We just have to, you know, that's one place where again I'm I'm looking for, you know, how we best present that to that sort of communication, that sort of uh, uh, just, you know, get them understanding. Like again, you know, we're being honest. We've been trying, we've been doing these various things to try and save money, cut out of our regular budget request from the town. The source is dried up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I think we can. I think we can get their support on this stuff, but that sort of process makes it more likely. You're gonna go through this. I, I just have like, I just need to understand some. Ask away. So, what is it about the speech and PT staffing? What was the forty-five thousand dollar increase, and in, how come the state revolving can't? Um, support it anymore. So I don't know how far historically it goes back to where these two positions started being paid out of here, but I can tell you what I can see is that this year there was not enough revenue being brought in to even continue to carry these salaries and we had to use the reserves this year to pay them. So going into next year, there's a very minimal amount of money rolling over and the revenue coming in cannot support them as well as the other, because there's other salaries that are paid from that account as well. Okay. So we had to offload something, um, whether it was IAs or these two positions. These are both part-time positions, mm -hmm. um, so those were moved off. So it's not the position itself, we can choose something else to write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. What are the, what are the, uh, what's the revenue sources that are, that are coming into that fund? Uh, it's tuitions for, for students that are coming. The early childhood ones? Or uh, tuition? Other non-tuition non students. Other yeah. tuition yeah. students. Yeah. students. Yeah. Okay. With, with, with needs, they bring right. more than choice. Right. Okay. Because that's number is dropping, right? Yeah. Significantly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the, the new teacher and the two new IAs. If we go through that, we're going to be having to add a new teacher next year also because of the, is that the sixth grade is going to? Yeah, we're going to have one more classroom in next year's budget. Sorry. This teacher position, though, isn't specific to a classroom. Though. That's right. It's a lead teacher position. Right now, this is what we talked about briefly at previous meetings. Um, Right now, the, the, they are running 110%. A staff is running 110%. When one of them's out, um, you know, Ben's out of the battle, is out handling issues all day long. And this is to bring help with case management um, and overall helping in the classrooms, kind of a hands on and oversight kind of position to help out in that area. And this is, again, my observation and also Ben's, um, and we have some people in the room that can probably attest to this as well, um, that it, the needs are so high that. A, a single or a couple um, students could pull teachers away from their responsibility for an entire day. We don't have anybody that fills that gap for the other students. And so um, larger disc schools have multiple multiple layers here. And, and we'll try to get the evidence to show comparable size schools and how they're addressing those needs. But our special needs population, the level of need is increasing. And whether or not you can follow national trends or that kind of stuff, or we just have a blip blip in the county radar right now, you know, I, the, those are just kind of different. It, it is what it is. It's our problem in front of us. Are you seeing the same thing at the other three elementary schools? Yeah. Same to this similar. Not thing. consistently building, building, but there are other, there are other buildings with, there's another building up, you know, Deerville has the same, I can go there. Deerville has the same issue where they're also seeing an increase in behaviorals um, with in some of the earlier childhood. And the idea is early intervention, is going to save us down the road. It's going to, I mean, all the work that's done early is saved money down the road. And so, you know, supporting those programs and helping those kiddos out, um, you know, keeps them out of specialized programming in secondary. 
you know what I mean? So in, in the long run, it saves money, but I don't know how you do that math, math problem and sell that to town, but that's, there's truth in it. But if I can <clears> look at, you know, the, the numbers you've got here, and if, um, you know, it sure seems like those positions of team leader and two new IAs or something that, yeah, there's a serious need for. And at that point, yeah, I mean, how do you avoid talking about a big percentage? Right. And that's why I was, and I was giving you both those numbers to, to talk about what is it, this is what it looks like there. And then, you you know, as Ben kind of was like, you know, don't go cutting so quickly. Yeah. You know, it's very easy. The first thing to do is say, well, add nothing new. You know, that's that's an easy, you know what I mean? And no changes in, in just, you know, level fund, you know, that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. the needs aren't level. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's what we're going to have to get around. In yeah, how do we explain it? And are the two IA positions that he's looking for trying to bring us back up to the numbers we were at prior We reduced to those, we reduced those before, and they're also directly connected to students' needs in the classrooms based on student needs. So it's not just like, oh, what's, what's, you know, let's, let's restock the shelves. Okay. It doesn't matter if there's a, you know, storm coming. It's, you know, there's, we need, it's not restocking the shelves, it's, it's, it's serving, but serving the current current students, not stocking the shelves. Right. Specific students, <clears throat> it's not just formulated. Correct. So. I'm happy to answer other questions. So what's your, tell me again, the plan for our next meeting? The plan for our next meeting is that we will um, have the stronger other numbers and we'll kind of throw, I'll do it like we approached it last year with some different ideas and scenarios to look at looking at the different, we'll have the stronger revenues at that point, have a good idea where those are, and then kind of come up with a plan um, to show how far we can make it. And then we can kind of tweak what the top choices are in the sense of um, if we're reducing something, reducing the, from the ask, that is, or if we're reducing something from somewhere else in the budget. Mm -hmm. This is where we try to get creative and we can see how low we can, I don't see how low, but how reasonable we can make it. And then we can decide, is it, you know, are we going for a four? Do we have to get below four? Can we, can we go as much as five? And this is what the different things look like. Kind of last year, I kind of created almost a, everybody created scenario, scenario, and scenario, and then I had a red sheet, which was that please don't look at, but this is what would happen if we didn't get the override. We'll do the same kind of thing. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be no red sheet, um, but the same kind of idea. These are the different kind of, the different routes we can go by kind of adding on in the priority that the administration feels. Because you know, remember the, Kind of how it works. We give you the priority that we see as a field, and then you guys need or see it. Yeah, I'm. I'm. And I should tell you again. I'm just telling you what I'm thinking. And, uh, knowing that we have a date, I think with Lechman and Finance, you know, the first couple of days of March. Um, and it would be. I would think it would be useful to have some serious communication with them before that. Yeah. In way of. I'm just going to pull up my calendar because I'm trying you to... You know, and I'm not saying that means the whole committee shows up there, but, you know, it might be something that, geez, you know, can't get them involved. It, the, the, the more we're talking about a number that's bigger than 2 or 3%, the more important it is to get them involved early on in, in, the, in the scale of what we're looking at and <coughs> why we're looking at it and then what is, caused, what is causing, you know, particular difficulty this year. You know, the more you wait to the last moment to drop them on, drop it on them, the tougher set that's going to be. Yep. So we are next up on... When are we next We're up? early February. I think we're February like, 4th. Yeah. I'm in January. That's, that's like, no. Yeah, so we're early on. So we'll have an idea. I think it's probably more appropriate for us to bring a number then. And then, I mean, I'll see some of the select work tomorrow at, uh, at negotiations tomorrow night. So, um, I mean, I can start the conversation there. Kind and of I'll probably go and by. I'll see Scott. And I'll, and I'll talk to those guys at some point right. in the next couple of weeks or something right. just to start, you know, start laying a little bit of groundwork in yep. terms of yes, and, I, and I'll see them on February 1st because that's when we penciled in to have a walk through this building. So if it was Oh, you see that plan? Great. I haven't, he gave me two dates. I confirmed. I haven't heard confirmation back that it's on, but that's okay. the main plan. Great. Shelly, just a couple more questions. Yeah, okay. of course. So the, on the narrative sheet, it says the two new IAs is 44,000 on the, on the, the list it's 47 is that was are these the narratives just like an estimate no so the ias would be the new 
Uh, what line are you on? Hold oh, I'm on. sorry. No, I'm um, sorry. It says 44 here, and it says 52.8. Yeah, so that's for the additional salaries for the existing okay. staff. So it's combined on the same line. Okay. I just broke it out a little bit different in the narrative so you could see where the increases are. Okay, and then the, the, essentially it's like kind of the same question on the teacher salary because here it's like 70, but here it's 121. Yeah, so the 121 includes the new teacher, Perfect. the raises, any step increases, longevity. So it's cumulative because those all come into one line. Right. Yeah, it's, in, it's, only, it's interesting because it's 70,000 here, but if you add the 55, that brings us up to 125. But this says salary increases, added teacher, 17,000 longevity, plus step increases, and I thought, I, I would assume it would be more. Nope, that's based on actuals. Okay. Yeah, we plugged in every existing teacher um, and considered where their step and their wage will be. There's also some change. So what you went into last year for the budget was the staff from the prior year before. Mm -hmm. So some of those folks may have left and the new higher steps are different. You know, so it's not 100% cut and dry math wise. <laughs> um, it's actually pretty complicated. But. Okay. And then so when we're looking at teachers, the the medical therapeutic, the, the switch of um, speech and PT. Yep. And in the IAs, that's 90% of the increase, just those three line items. Yes. And it's, that's that's it's, that's, that's, that's cool for all the schools. Yeah. Is that it, the, the, the 80 to 90% is just staffing. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And that's even within, those are within parameters that are, you know, can be considered low at some point. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the anticipated teacher, existing teacher salary increase and the existing IA salary increase is 3%, just with nothing else. Because what people, people are concentrating when you're talking about the negotiations, the numbers of, that only, is really the number one thing is discussed is COLA. So basically COLA, you know, the cost of living, uh, cost of living adjustment is, you know, so what is the increase, but that goes on top of steps. Mm -hmm. And then you also have column changes, you have step steps, and then column changes, and then you also have longevity payments and those kind of things. So those are all falling into that same line. So the actual, we were kind of doing the math right now based on what we had plugged in, the actual um, salary increases for Sunderland is four point, you give me a minute, four point nine, somewhere in the four range. It's not, you know, so it, it, there's, you have to add it all together for the total movement and salary. So, um, I mean, right now the um, steps, the, the, the space between steps is 3.19. It's 3.19. So you're adding whatever COLA to that for the actual wage for those who are stepping. Those are at the top step, it's COLA only. So we kind of have- those are going to the next column also. That's right, another so column correct. changes. But column changes, I mean, and then it's I try not to look at column changes because there's work that gets the, I mean, there's someone's working on a, it's oh, yeah. working on a master's or something right. doing a column change that, that they're working, professional developing, moving that way. Right. Um, but the, so there's that, that's kind of the issue. The other issue we have as a district, about 50% of our teachers are on the top step. Right. So any movement is very expensive. And that's where, that's where also the difficulty that we're having, I'm just saying for the negotiation table where it's difficulty is any small movement there where you're trying to sh shift is, has a huge impact on budgets because so the most money to move the smallest percentage. So <clears throat> those are just the problems. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Luke. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Other good news? You want to talk about capital? All right. So we have a a few capital issues that. It's you know it's the timing of the building of, of the age. Um, where should we go? What, what, what do you want first? Let's do the boiler. Boiler first. All right, so right now the Sunderland runs on two boilers, okay? The building can run on one um, until it gets, this is according to, I actually spoke with the HVAC guy today because I was running this, this plan by him. Um, it can run on one unless it falls below 10 degrees. And then it will not be able to keep up with the temperature. It will keep up with the temperature not to freeze the building, but not warm enough for a comfortable classroom environment. Okay. Right now we have a boil, one of our boilers, um, it's got a crack. It's made up of eight compartments. So I'm over-educating you on boilers. It's made up of eight, comp eight compartments. We've already replaced three of the compartments over the years. This 1987 boiler, the last compartment is now leaking. 
and it can go at any time. I said, what does that mean? It means you can make glass till spring or it can go tomorrow. Okay. To fix that compartment, the estimate that we got was um, $8,500. Okay. To replace the entire boiler, it started at the, um, off the cuff. He gave us a, a 40 mark, um, a $40,000 mark, but I, asked, uh, I didn't ask, this is all uh, Bill Hildreth's work, um, to go back and get a firm number and it is now 29.5 for a new boiler. That's one of two new boilers. One of the two. Right. Okay. And so we have a decision 29. to spend just under $10,000 now to repair a 1987 boiler or let it ride until we can figure out how to come up with $30,000 if not and add that to a priority to our capital expenses to the town when they do our walkthrough to put that on the list of capital needs for the, for the, uh, sorry, for the, uh, you know, for the, this spring and kind of pray we get through. Because it could go, it could last a year with its drip. Could go right now. It could go, it could have gone last week when we first, were, whenever it started, the first was discovered it's leaking. So we've already been on borrowed time. So I asked him, I said, okay, let's play this out. Because I don't want to be the guy who, yeah. It freezes the school because I said let's let it ride. Worst case scenario, <laughs> we actually thought this through. Worst case scenario is it, let's say it goes tomorrow. We have a cold spell of another three days in front of us. Okay, um, the building wouldn't be able to keep the temperature where school would be in play, and it would take them about 24 hours, to or more, to get the parts to fix it. Same amount of lead time to replace the entire boiler. If we lost, you know, so we could do an emergency, try to figure out how to pay for the boiler which means we eventually have to go to town to somehow get money back because you just heard our budget issue regarding next year, but we want to use choice. If we burned all this choice money up to fix the boiler, you understand what I'm saying? So, so in an emergency, we could get it fixed. It's possible that we lose a day of school if it happens to happen in the middle of a cold spell. Um, they could get a snow day. Um, you know, worst case scenario is it's record lows and it boil goes in the beginning of a record lows of three days and it takes them multiple days to get the materials and kids are missing more, you know, have to make up more than one day at the end of the school year. But to me, there's this, it's paying $10,000 to pick a 1987, let's just make pretend it's our Honda out in the parking lot, to put a $10,000 fix on a 1987 Honda or buy a new Honda. It's time for a new Honda, and to put that kind of money into it, you're not getting that money back. They're not taking that piece off and adding it to another boiler, so you can get your money's worth out of it. Any change in the efficiency? I imagine it's not. A, I asked the question. It's not a high enough where you're going to say we're going to win on this because it's oil burn. If we could convert to gas, but there's a moratorium on gas right now. If we're going to bring in tanks, we're not going to save our money on that. So, but if we could have switched to gas. We would have saved money. just by getting a newer oil burner. It's not got to have some efficiency. It's it probably. I mean, it probably has to, but not to the amount where you're like, we're going to see this in the next, you know, immediately. We will see yeah. to yeah, some level of burning, but you're not. You know, we'll save a couple hundred bucks. You know, it, it's certainly better. Better. It's going to have. You know, and but it's not enough where you, that's where they're, they're selling gas efficiency is when they're is where they're. What's, what's the what's the time requirement for putting in a new boiler? We just decided. He needs a full day. What? He needs a full day. A full That's day? after he gets the parts. Okay. So. But but he needs a full day uh, during which the school. That boiler, one boiler could still work, will be operational at all times, but the second boiler obviously will have to take down, take offline and put it in. Right, but you still got a boiler kicking out heat. Correct. The, the building is safe. And if we put in a new boiler, will the new boiler still have Will the heat output from that still have the same limitation that it's good until you get down to 10 degrees and then it's questionable? The idea is that you have a dual boiler system on purpose so that if ever one goes down, the building is not in danger. But the building is not warm enough to operate. Warm enough to operate means you have to keep it at 68 degrees. Right. You know what I mean? That, might, that like might even be pressing it. <laughs> I had some people in the crowd that they would set my costume at 68 degrees. Um, but you know what I mean? But it's, you know, keeping at, you know, warm, the temperature we're in now, whatever it is in here. Now, now the other boiler, the one that we have fixed three of these eight sections within the recent past. This is the current boiler that's, that's replacing three of the eight sections. Well, what's the other boiler like? Does it have a bad history too? 
the one we're I don't not have the evidence. About I don't have the other. I don't have the other boiler information. Okay. But that's the one that we repaired last year. They had a crack in it that the insurance covered. That's the one we're talking about right here. No. That's the, the other one. The work. The one we're not talking about. Correct. Right? Okay. Sorry. Slow. I can get the age <laughs> of the other boiler. They probably should add that. But either way, it doesn't affect the two boiler system that we're running off of. Sorry, you want my opinion? Let's hear. That's what we're here for. Get the damn new, get the new boiler. You want to know how to pay for it? How I would pay for it? That's why we're here. <laughs> I think the nine grand you got in the building maintenance fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you need another 20. Okay, and I take the 20 out of school choice because it's the only place you got that you can appropriate money from without any delay. Okay. So the question is, do you, but do you hold on that and not, not I mean, and right then, now, right oh, now, right, we couldn't, then, we couldn't do it. And then you see, and you file an insurance claim and see what you can get from the We've insurance already, We have a file an insurance claim and they're going to come out and take a look at it. Right. I do not believe, I, I assume that the insurance people are not watching this meeting, but I do, I do not believe that they are going to say that a crack in a 1987 boiler is an insurable, is an insurance thing. But we're trying. We're trying. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I so, um, but, and that, and so again, going so the question talks about, it talks about funding models. You take the, you take the 20,000 out of school choice is $20,000 that we can't offset the budget next year. That's yeah. correct. So and so that, that's, that's inability to shrink that 8%. It's inability to shrink that 8% and get the, either some of the needs or whatever the, the story, it, it comes off of there. So that was where I'm saying, if you let it ride, we can then put it on the top of our needs for capital improvement. We'll get that, I'd say, pretty easily through the capital committee. It's a clear need. Um, and to fund it that way. It's rolling the dice. But you don't get that money until this summer. Correct. I'm rolling that's going to last the heating season. It only has to last the heating season on days that are above 10 degrees, below 10 degrees. Yeah. We did get some insurance for the repairs. Just, or we can take the 10 grand and we can go down to the casino, we can see how our luck is down there. <laughs> <laughs> no, just to be a moron about it, it can be shut off on days when that are above 10, so that all the load is on the other one? Is that, is that what you're saying? Or? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the yes. other one can run without it. So I don't know how they even the balance yeah. of it. I don't know if it's more stress to turn on and off. Is it out of my? Right. I'd be doing that. Um, so. Okay. Next item. Well, we <laughs> <monitor that. laughs> All right. So. Why are we gotta keep making. We gotta keep moving. We do have to keep moving, but my question is: You guys have to answer my question. No, what do you want to do? Opinion. Anyone else have an opinion? It's a big capital expense to take out of school choice. And so the other question is, but here's the, here's the thing, and you know we could sit down and go over what the school choice act numbers actually are because we started this fiscal year. Okay, when we made the budget during the winter last year, the idea was we were going to end last fiscal year with like seven thousand in school choice. Okay, and then we voted to use 220 in school choice for the current year budget. Okay, because we weren't keeping as good track of school choice, you know, revenue as we might have, we ended up getting a bunch more in school choice. So we had something. I think we got something like an extra 90,000. Okay, in school choice for the closing of. FY19, okay, and so year end, okay, we were, you know, and then we spent some on the fixing up of the uh, new art room, okay, but we're, you know, dealing with, you know, a starting position for this year of something like, I'll say 70 or 80,000. Okay, now what are we looking at for this year? We got in the budget 220 grand. Okay, unless, you know, who knows what pops up that we may have to go diving for. But this is certainly, you know, um, we, 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 the, we're, we're assuming we're spending 220. What are we going to take in? Okay, 
Now, the state has put out a number that says that, you know, they're thinking we're going to take in like just over 300. Okay. But the problem with the state thing, what really matters is what the actuals are, okay, during the year. And the actuals so far this year, up to December, what I've seen for enrollment is we were starting out at 50 school choice kids, and the last couple of months we've been 53 school choice kids. Now, that doesn't tell you about the school increments, but the numbers aren't getting any worse. Correct. Okay. And so if the number is, if the end year number turns out to be, let's say, 300,000, okay, which I think is going to be at least, okay, and we budgeted 220, mm -hmm. that's 80 more than the starting position, okay, and 80 more than the starting position puts you at 150, 160, starting to pitch in for next year, okay, and if you just roll over, you know, if you, if you swallow none of this budget increase with school choice money, okay, and you say we're going to use 200 again, and school choice still stays around the 50 number, then each year you're just, you know, increasing this whole buffer thing. Right. But so right. then the question is, how do you, how do you, go, if you want to spend some money, what's the best way to spend it? And my sense is that if you spend it, if you spend 20 grand on a boiler, you spend it one time on the boiler, okay? And maybe it makes you a little more hesitant to spend something, uh, you know, else. You know, the money we're talking about spending maybe to help this budget is coming out of next fiscal year, not this one even, so we're going to be already through the closing of the books on on this fiscal year. And, you know, my sense was that, you know, I've been sort of thinking to myself, well, if they come in with ideas to spend it, school choice money in this fiscal year, let's try and make sure they spend it on one-time stuff only, because that way it doesn't, you know, add to your, you know, ongoing obligations. Okay, so I see this as spending 20 grand on a one-time thing, doesn't affect anything to do with, you know, FY21 budget or beyond, or FY21 school choice obligations or beyond, because it's a one-time thing. And so, you know, my hope was that to the extent that you're going to use school choice money sooner rather than later, because, you know, it's money and, yeah, we've got things we need, do it on one-time stuff. Now, you could say, well, maybe we could get this stuff, you know, we go the other, we go the other way and we could get it uh, from the town, we got a lot of other things here on our list we're getting from the town too, okay? And while they don't have the immediacy that this does, we also need to be making progress on that. So it's not like we put this, we put the boiler on the, the town's capital list and, you know, bingo, we get it and it doesn't affect anything else we're getting. You know, it's just, okay, we're putting that on instead of something else we also really need. Now, you know, and then it's sort of like, well, if you really need this really emergency, geez, you know, you're not gonna get the money. You can't spend the money through July. You know, even if, you know, even if we all agree to it. Yeah, it's just my thinking. Now, I was sort of, I, at, when I first, you know, when this first came up, I looked at the clock. It was already, I was hoping we'd be out of here by 7, because the selectman got a meeting at 7, but it wasn't going to, it's not going to last more than 10 or 15 minutes. I already talked to Cindy, because I want to go over them and start telling them about, you know, this sort of discussion and see what they think. Because, I, you know, I'm sort of thinking, I'm curious to see, you know, because I think it's worth asking because those guys, you know, they run the town. And you think it's safe, you know, having here with a boiler that might go, you know, is that something we want to deal with? You know, or can we somehow get, you know, like political credit for going ahead and using some school choice money for this because we didn't think the town would want to be in a position for something to happen or something. I don't know. I'm just <coughs> throwing stuff out. I don't, I don't, I don't think you get any credit for using the money in that way. Well, I, I, think, I, I, think think you, I think you work. Because. Taxpayers look at the percentage increase and they're gonna look at that, you know, and so, and then the next, we're always gonna have the next thing that has to be repaired. Right, but yeah. if but, you don't repair some stuff, it's not like the school's gonna shut down. Okay. So, it's fine, I don't, it could go either way. And I, I'm loath to spend school choice money on. I, I feel like we dug ourselves into such a bad place that um, I, I get nervous. However, I don't have an end goal of what to, I feel like I'm just saving, 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 yeah. without a, a clear plan of actually what to use it for. So, and I think Peter makes a compelling case. Um, I think the one thing that I kept hearing in my, um, from the select board, my rudimentary training that they've basically given me is um, uh, 
basically what Peter mentioned about the single non-recurring expenditures that uh, this would be a place to we, we, we can't be using school choice on, on recurring expenditures the best place is the non-recurring expenditures. so it does make some sense um, the only problem is that the, the non-occurring expenditures are not taking anything out of the budget. Right. So if I said, let's use school choice money to buy computers and remove the computer line from the budget to save 20000 in the budget, then we've had a budget moving forward where we're able to offset those numbers. It, right. it just That's my concern. My concern was trying to lower that percentage somehow with using you know, school choice creatively to be able to keep the programs in the building Alive. And I know, you know, it, it, everything's kind of got its own font, its how own much, silo. How much, how much, I mean, you must have given some thought as to how much money you're going to suggest coming out of school choice for this budget. Correct. What sort of thoughts are you, what sort of numbers you've been tossing around? Well, I mean, it depends on where it comes in. I, I still believe that you have to keep a reserve because that's, that's all you right. have for the things. But if you're talking about between one or two percent worth, closer to two percent worth out of school choice. So you're talking about $60,000. Because I believe it's going to come in at 150, and then it keeps you. Then you keep about 60 in reserves for a boiler, <laughs> the other boiler. You know what I mean? It's, it's that kind of. It's a joke because that we use the boiler as the example, and now we got a boiler that's broken. But that was, you know, one of the things that we were going to be looking at. But we got to confirm that we have those numbers right before we come in, and, and we go off what the state gives us for that. That before we start kind of using that money as a revenue source. But I mean, we do, and then we also have to look at where all the kids are with the analysis of school choice of. If we're losing 10 in sixth grade next year, are we refilling the coffers with that as well? And so how much, do we, you know, you've got to keep that, you know, it becomes the, it, it's become the, you know, I wish there would be greater, we built a system that it has become the free cash of the school to deal with the emergencies that didn't exist 30 years ago from special education needs that have skyrocketed in price to other things where the town, town free cash would bail out a boiler 50 years ago the school committee would call, contact the town and say, can we use free cash for the boiler? And they would say, maybe yes. You know what I mean? But it's a now everything's gotten so siloed by department and the school it, you know, itself, I mean, this is, you know, it's a, you have to go through the kind of these processes that we, we set. I mean, I wish there was more. Right, we were using free cash. We couldn't do it until we had a special town meeting to appropriate it. And so we couldn't do it before the oh, middle of late March anyway. Right. You know, they're used to, in, in some towns yeah. when, uh, and it was in Pelmont School Committee, the, they had a thing on, on the town warrant, a special education fund, that if they went over in their budget, they then could go and use the $30,000 that was placed aside outside of the budget for emergency needs within special education. I don't know, it, it was never accessed when I was there, and it says even as things got tighter, but it was always there in case you had that out of you know, the out of district placement that came up suddenly or someone moved in that, you know, a small school budget can't be, so they use the larger budget to protect the smaller budget. But, I mean, those are just kind of creative ways where, you know, within, but, um, you know, we can, you know, I, I'd rather not roll the dice either. I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get, you know, call Ben every morning and say, hey, did I win last night? Did we get through the night? Um, I was just trying to look at a way, I, you know, I just don't, Nobody wants to pay for a new boiler. You know what I mean? It's, it's especially when it's working right now. But it's it's gonna die. But it's it's working right now. You know what I mean? It's like I'll keep refilling the, the hole in my tire. You mean refilling the tire that has got a hole in it to see how long until you get that tire worn down? You know that kind of idea. As long as the hole is slow enough. But this one we don't know. So um, I just you know if if the the committee feels we should use school choice money, then we'll move forward using school choice money to do to, to do this. How many compartments are in the boiler? What's that? How many compartments are in the boiler? Ten. No, eight. 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 <laughs> so it costs close to ten grand to fix one, or thirty to fix the to repair the whole. Oh, well, actually, well, you're not spending the ten. The question yeah. is, do we wait, or I would think we're all. I think we're all. I'm, yeah. I can't speak for you. But some people might want to spend the ten, but I think it makes no sense to spend a third of the cost of a boiler, just under a third of the cost of the boiler, to. And the wait would be, the plan if we wait is that we go through the nominal capital request. The process with the town. I, that I, I was saying that what we're actually waiting is two months to get out of the cold season and take that boiler offline. But then go through the capital process, which then shoves everything else down a priority level. Okay. Okay. Which there may be something that is less expensive that could then get funded from school choice that's on that capital list, just moving things. 
once we know what we're getting. What's high up on that list right now? On what? The capital. Capital. The capital. We have the band around the building. That's right. And whether or not, you know, um, whether, how we should approach that, the, the price of it. We've got another quote that's a lot lower than the other quote, but it's 50, let's say $50,000. Um, you know, it's a, a pretty expensive project. The other one is the, There's risk either way we go, and yeah. the risks are different. There's financial risk with using the school choice money that we're using reserves, and if we go the other way and replace it, um, or don't replace it, I'm sorry, there's risk that it breaks, and then we have to close school for three to five days because we don't have enough heat in the building and hope that we get the parts, and so which and There's also the political lesson? risk. So, Peter, you, I mean, I was at the, the Previous select meeting that was there was snowed in very lately. Attended. You've been having lots of uh, communications. Um, you're right. There's only so much money. So whether we get it from the the capital or somewhere else, um, you feel like we can say. By the way, you know, let's say why why is your budget increase so big? We can say we just ate well, choice money for the boiler, which is a one-time expense, which is where you asked us to spend. Our uh, our choice money. So the things that are in red for our priority level meeting that we'd like are on the top of our list. The exterior rim band we have in there for sixty thousand right now. Replace the rotten gable vent trims and the falling the failing soffit for just under ten grand. Um, classroom flooring upgrades, three rooms for eighteen thousand. The underground oil tank inspection, spill protection manhole for thirteen thousand. And then the window replacement for seventy thousand. So, and now uh, twenty thousand for. Yeah. Um, what? Um, so say we don't do it. We keep our fingers crossed. Roll the dice, and worst case scenario, the thing craps out. How do we pay for it then? And how long does it take? It takes a day to get it and a day to install it at, at, the, at the fastest. And then we're forced to pay it out of school choice. And then pay it out of school yeah. choice anyway. Could we use that building use fund? We would use the building use fund okay. to yep. knock it down. And then that that is no longer available I mean, right. until it gets replenished at fifty dollars a right. session of people using the gym. All right. So if we if we don't replace it, no additional pot of money there. Right. If we don't replace it, it's going to crap out. Uh, if we if we decide to replace it, it will probably last. I think we're looking at that Murphy's Law kind of thing. Um, okay, but I mean, I mean, and, and you know, Jessica asking that question makes us say maybe we're not in the position of maybe we're not in the position where we should be gambling on. You know, school being open or not. That's what we're losing. It's not you know, the building's not going to freeze. The other boiler can handle it, but the it will. We probably will not be able to have. If it's not a, if it craps out and then we have a freezing day the following day, meaning below 10 degrees, it doesn't keep out. So you got to have two things. There's got to be somebody, somebody out there's got to have, to, you know, got to be a gambling person who can do the odds on this thing. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning toward agreeing with Peter and just doing this. Getting it done. This is kind of the reason. And if I was see if this was just me and I'm just dealing with it, okay, I actually would tomorrow morning call up a couple of selectmen that know more about this stuff and say, This is the situation, okay, you got any opinion as to, you know, which one you think makes more sense. And just see. Mm -hmm. Not that it's their decision, but just to see. And if they if they strongly say, Oh hell, you know, roll the dice, you know, or that thing will last, I've been down there, I looked at it, it's gonna you know, whatever. At least then, if the thing all blows up on you, you know, you got people. You trying to defer responsibility? Hey. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is politics. You know, that's, it's like they run the town. Okay, this is one of the buildings they're in charge of. Okay, this is, this is what's on the list of, you know, someone comes through and says, here's the things that need to be done in town buildings. And this is, 
prime, you know, prime real estate on that list. And uh, I would, I would just, you know, I mean, regardless of what we do here tonight, you know, I, I mean, I sent them the, you know, whatever email you sent us, it just said, hey, you know, we got another building issue. Yep. Okay, and I sent them that, and all I just said, hey, you know, another building issue, FYI, Peter, because I was out of town, and I figured, well, at least let them know. Yep. But whether they've got, you know, they're both building guys. I'm talking, you know, Tom and, Tom and uh, Scott. You know, and they may well have strong opinions as to what makes any sense or don't make any sense, and that might well be worth listening to. Okay. Just but, to be clear, were you hoping for a, was this the kind of thing that you would think should be voted? Technically, technically, voted because spending money? Technically, I don't need the committee's approval mm -hmm. to spend school choice money, but I have been scolded by school, by school committees for yeah. spending school choice money without approval because it's not my free cash to do it as I please. And talking about $30,000 yeah. is a significant portion to just go ahead and do. And so therefore, I am deferring my... You're, <laughs> covering, you're covering the way, your butt the way I want to cover our butt. <laughs> right. okay. That it's, it, that's a significant, it used, it, I mean, originally, I mean, we can now have gone down to 20, but walking in the room was at 30. Right. Um, you know, we can get it to $20,000. That's a significant amount of school choice to be using uh, the savings. And anyway, you'd, you'd come right back and say, we just saved that up and you spent it. And so um, that's, why it's on the, that's why it's on the ticket. So repair. Repair now and find a way to do it, or not try to not repair and try to hold out the things. I will call. I'll try to give Scott a call in the morning, see if he has an opinion on it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm biased. I am, I understand that it will inhibit our ability to reduce the number, the the size of the growth we're asking for. But uh, and I'd be happy to to be on that call. But uh, I'm inclined to not roll the dice with with having the building closed. Why don't you someone do a motion to yeah. um, pay for this, uh, find a way to pay for this using current funds and school choice, and then, and, and I also make a motion to use school funds to replace the boiler. Um, I guess in uh, and and <laughs> yeah. while being in communication with the select board. But using the school use fund first. Yes. Okay. Yeah. For the two funds. Yes. Yeah, I'll second. All in favor? Or can I just read this? Just so, um, so this would be moved that uh, uh, we use school choice and school user funds uh, to replace the boiler after consultation with the uh, members of the board. The members of the select board. Sounds good. Is that right? I'm good with that. Yeah, and our, our next meeting, do we say it's early February? I'm sorry, I don't know. A couple weeks from now. Fourth, February 4th. So, okay, so if they disagreed, we're only rolling the dice so for like two question. weeks. If they disagree, what, what's their plan? If they disagree, then I think that's worth considering. Okay. Yeah, and we'll be back together in two weeks and we can already see But the then this the freezing season will always be over. Right? <laughs> that's true. We don't have to gamble a little bit, so it's fine. We're just going to get to. It's gonna break in the first roll. It's gonna be yeah, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna break April 30th. We won't have this problem. All right, we'll <laughs> we'll take care of it. The other issue um, is Hold that on. the we need to vote on that. That was a motion. Yeah. Oh, we'll sorry. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I got the motion here. So you want to vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. What was the vote? Yes. Five all. Five. Okay. Yep. All right, the other issue is the walk-in freezer that went down during the holiday break. Um, we got, her, I, sent, I just sent out the results from the uh, insurance company, starting to get tired. Uh, the insurance company, they are not going to pay for the repairs, but they may be paying for the product loss that we have. However, the number for the product loss was around 30... 31.81.85. 31.81.85. However, they are now saying that they are not going to reimburse us for the government supply that they was in may there. not. May not. And so we're kind of in conversation with them. So it's still a bit ongoing because we didn't pay for that. However, that offsets our... The free government pays for most of the proteins that we get from the cheeses and the meats. And so... Um, if they're gone, someone's going to buy replacement. We have to pay for yeah, the yeah. replacement, and yeah. so we're having that argument. 
yeah. with them. So they or basically right now have told Mary that they don't really know how to proceed with this because typically you buy the product and so then they replace it, but because we get it for free, they're not sure how to handle that. What's the, what's the value of it? Right. So we, she's we really provided... really get it for free. I don't think we get anything for free. The government subsidies, yeah. Where does that come from? Well, you pay for it. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> but you've already paid for it once. We already paid for it. The question is, we've got to get you to pay for it twice. So she's provided a market value based on her vendors of where she would buy things, and that's where the 31 81 85 comes from, from our, what we've actually paid for, plus the market value of the stuff that we've gotten for free. Um, and so she's in conversation with them about how much they're going to cover. So there's some amount that they're going to pay for. We don't know what it is yet, but they're also going to take the $1,000 deductible right. out of that. So um, we won't get back the full amount regardless. So um, we are looking at, and they aren't going to pay for the repair of that. Um, and so um, that's another just over $1,000. $1,300. We're thinking about paying for that out of the food program. Um, that one that you were talking about before, and so it's a little bit of a hit um, there, but it's an appropriate spot, and so on and so forth. But that's kind of just a. I stopped at town halls today, and I checked the accountant's uh, uh, statement of the status of that fund, mm -hmm. and I was real surprised to see that the pot it was a positive balance, of course, but I was real surprised to see it was like only nine thousand or something, and then I looked on the cover sheet to the report, because I listed all the town's accounts, and yeah. I listed the cover sheet, and it said for these special funds that they were, it was updated as for expenses as of January 10th. In other words, any warrants that had been filed by then, but revenue only up to the end of September. So it's missing like at least three months of revenue, which is running through usually about five grand a month or something like that. So that puts us in the someplace solidly between twenty and thirty thousand. Right. Okay, and so you know, even if we're not quite break even for the year or something like that, it's not like suddenly we got another issue that's got to be addressed this year. I mean, we're not going into the red in that account for some time, right. and so yeah, to be a no-brainer. Yep. Pull it out we just here. have to continue to be cautious that if we observe after this year that the program can't carry Correct. Mary's salary, that you know Correct. if we have to use some reserve funds before it gets absorbed back into the local budget, because that could happen. If, you know, this is kind of a test to see if we can make it work, which we think we can. But but you know why that you know why that happened? What? Why the balance got so high? No, I don't. Because we were there was miscommunication between business manager Patty and the person running the food service program at the time and when she said we have a deficit of like so like one year she'd say we got a deficit of two thousand okay so Patty would transfer two thousand and the next year that she'd say we got a deficit of three thousand Patty would transfer three thousand but in fact the three thousand was the cumulative deficit in her mind and so we only had an additional one thousand deficit and so then the next year there was another one thousand deficit and Patty transferred four grand and the sure. next and so on, and so it's just like, you know, and it's sort of like, well, you know, at this point, at least we're benefiting from that because someone's been putting money aside. It's called savings. Yeah, yeah it's called savings. Yeah. So, you know, we got to be well, careful how we use it. Last but year, it appears that, you know, there was. I, I, I never did see a final report from last year, but were, were we pretty close to break even on that, including Mary's I, salary? It, well, Mary's salary didn't come out of it last year. Mary's salary last year came out of. Well, uh, okay. So this is the first year. This is year the first year, right? and this year we're pretty close. We think we're going to be pretty close to even. Right now we're under, but right. based on yeah. projected sales. Okay. Um, and then the last one is just an FYI: the lighting in the parking lot. Really sincerely, we are we got some quotes on that, and we are moving forward to have that repaired, and we're going to take that out of general maintenance. And that's just just under. That's for about twelve hundred dollars, um, and. They may have to do a follow-up um, later on for some underground wiring um, after the fix for another um, another fourteen hundred dollars, but that can also go on to the next year's budget. But we're going to take that out of local maintenance um, and repairs. Okay. But just I'm just stating that because I did also receive a letter from a community member concerned about the right. Sure, yeah. I think they're absolutely correct, and so that's going to replace the ballasts, repair the three lamps that are out completely. Um, and also the, the switches on them. Um, but is that address still one out by the street too? The, 
Not the one on the street. I think that's a town one. Ours are the ones that get the black. Once you get the, the little shorter black poles. Okay. And I think the one that the, the one on the main street. I think it might be a town. Like I can find out. I mean, is that out? No, I thought we had that discussion. That that one. What was the letter? Was the letter about? Um, Well, it says the solar powered lighting for the SES information board near the street is not working. Oh, you need to look at that too. Okay. I think I'm going to put that too. Okay. But yeah, so anyway, as we walk out to our dark cars tonight, hopefully that'll be the last time that happens. Uh, so, what was the number on the, uh, on the freezer repair? 1300 $1,300? That's two separate bills. Put together. Okay. There was two bills come together to make the thirteen hundred. So if you're looking okay. at one was five hundred. Paying that out of school lunch. But the difference is the five hundred seven something and change. Okay. Good. Okay. Phew. We're still going. You got any more capital stuff? Because I got I got just the fact that, as far as I know, we haven't submitted anything to the town capital committee. We haven't because we asked them to come out and take a look, and so, and I've been back and forth with Scott Burrs around for okay. the capital committee to come out. Let's take a walk around and then. Good. We're ready to submit, um, but we wanted them to see it for themselves, that kind of thing, so they can weigh in on it, because the list is yeah. so long, we'll take any one of we'll take what we can get kind of deal. Right. Um, and we have set a, again, he has he gave me dates, I confirmed those dates, he has not confirmed back, but we're looking at Saturday, February 1st at 8 a.m. Okay. So I, they had a meeting at that committee last Tuesday, okay. and I was out of town and I missed it, and I guess Wednesday they went over to look at Frontier, um, because the town's going to have to, I guess there's going to be a frontier capital request coming to town meetings this April or not? First, you no, know, we haven't, we haven't made the decision yet. But okay, well, maybe this is part of the, I don't know. Anyway, um, then I asked, and I, I asked, uh, you know, I looked at the packet that had been handed out at Tuesday's meeting, and there were proposals from fire department, highway, police. But nothing from the school, so that's why I was just, you know, are we, you know, it's a thing. At some point, we've got to get so, that in. So yeah, and so the reason why there's the pause there. Well, again, remember when we we came with this plan and. Oh no, I think it's right. As long as you're, I think the tour ought to come first because then you'll get feedback as to what they care about. Right, and I think because one of the issues was whether or not we do the banding over multiple years, and we right. want them to look at that and get their thoughts on that. Right. You know, um, the more straightforward one is redoing the floors over and getting on a program like many of the other buildings are doing, doing a few each year over the years, and getting them to see it and then say, okay. We, you know, we'll commit to that program, you know, kind of that program, and then looking at the soffit, you know, these are all no, I, I, not I pretty just, repairs. I was just dismayed. I was just getting dismayed that the tour hadn't happened, and then, well, is the tour ever going to happen? Because I think that's absolutely critical step to in, to getting to getting people to buy in. That's what I'm trying to get at. Right. Can we join the tour? Yeah. Come on over. 8 a.m. When? Uh, Saturday, February 1. Can you send maybe a... a just when you do get a confirmation on it, could you let us send us a note so that if we do want, I'd love to come. Just you know, hang and watch. So if three of you are showing up, and have to post it. No, it's not a meeting. Is it? We can be in the same place if we don't talk. You can't talk to each other. Yeah. But you can talk. I think I just Everybody went into else. a rolling meeting with the capital improvement committee, and then we don't run into any problems, and you can talk about that as well. Okay. Have a with it. Great. Okay. Right. That'd be cool. Eight a.m. FK, you're welcome to bring a little camera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all I got for capital right now. That's it. We are not done though. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you already keep going. Say yeah. Uh, uh, so capital request vote to approve the 2019-2020 uh, school improvement plan. Do we did that? We did that. We did that without you. All right. We're sorry. Good. Sorry. All right. Where are we on that? Well, my apologies. Um, I'm going to talk about the um, memorandum of understanding. Let's do that. Because I, I don't think I think we should table building space because I need Ben here for that and okay. acknowledgement of the green donated landscaping. Um, that was a Ben item as well. So maybe we'll, we'll have to be late on that, but we can acknowledge because I'm sure there's a good story with it, and I think that. At the end, of, no one's watching. At the end of a three-hour, no, no, yeah. let's give them good last time. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I have a hand up here. This is the, uh, it's very straightforward. So, the currently the um, IAs, we've closed their contract. I know they've made changes to their contract. I got to bring it before all the school committees. But what has happened in some buildings, I'm not sure if it's happened at all in, in, in Sunderland. Um, I'll go one more of these. Yeah. I'll go off the official copy. Um, is the, we, we negotiated that um, when we use IAs to sub for classes, okay, and once it reaches an hour, they get paid for the full hour and any hour there afterwards, okay? So under an hour, it's just coverage. They're not doing full, they're not considered subs and getting sub, the additional $5. So the additional, let me stress that, the additional $5. This is not um, high, high stakes here, but the issue we were having is that a couple, two, two issues. One, that sometimes IAs were covering like for two 45 minute blocks and then getting nothing. And in some buildings, the principals were recognizing it, saying, oh, it was two 45 minute blocks, it's within the contract. Other ones, I was getting phone calls that the contract doesn't say that. Am I allowed to do that? And so that kind of brought it to my attention. And then when we met, I met with the union officials on it. And when they cover specials, specials are under an hour. So let's say you're the IA in a phys ed class. You're usually in there and the, there's no teacher that day and they say, well, you cover the class and you cover the whole class, you run the curriculum and you're running the whole thing. You are doing a different job, yet we're not paying you because the class is under an hour. And I said, if you're covering for a full class, we're gonna pay you to substitute. And so I just want to get your stamp of, that's basically what this is saying. This is also saying it's non-binding, meaning it's a, got a sunset clause in it, meaning that they're gonna have to renegotiate this in the next contract. So it will be brought back in and then for both parties to agree moving forward after this kind of a trial kind of thing. So it's kind of a lot of protection because we're changing the contract outside of the negotiation. But in essence, those are the two real things. So um, I absolutely think we should be IAs an extra $5 if they're covering. And if they're covering the whole day, they get more. Um, if they're covering phys ed the entire day, they get more. Um, they'll get the $35 extra. If um, they're covering two periods, which doesn't happen very often, but if they, you know, two 45 minute periods, um, and again, this is all with pre-approval by the principal. They can't just start keeping a diary and then try to submit that. It's like, I'm covering, you've been assigned to cover that, that kind of thing. So I'm just looking for you to approve that. Motion. No, I'll move. Second. All in favor, or discussion? All in favor? Five. Good. Good. Your Hancock here. Um, that's the memory of understanding. We did the collaborative vote. I don't have a report. You're doing your job, Greg. Sorry. Yeah, I, no, sorry. I, I came um, in with course. They came in, so I think. I appreciate you cleaning up. Um, you can go to negotiate. You can go yeah. to executive session. That's up to you guys. You didn't have. You didn't have a meeting in December, so I can give you an update. Um, People who had meetings in December did not. You and Conway didn't have a meeting in December and I come on Thursday. So other people have not gone to executive session because they've been up to date on what's going on. But it's all, that's up to you. We, it's on there because we are in negotiations with going to an executive session if you want. Shall we? I would like to do it. Excellent. All right. All right. Good voting.